This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And folks, this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of Jason Goes to Hell, the final Friday. Didn't they say that about the final chapter? <laughs> but, you know, folks, we had, this is when uh, the Friday the 13th franchise went to New Line Cinemas. And... Uh, and led, of course, of course, by the end of that movie, those of you who've seen it, hints of Freddy versus Jason, which is also celebrating an anniversary this year as well. Folks, I give you the director of that film, the wonderfully talented Adam Marcus. How do you do, Adam? I'm good, I'm good. How are you doing, brother? <laughs> oh, just getting over a cold, but other than that, I'm doing fine. Good. Do yeah. Good, man. good to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're dealing with flood season here in New Brunswick, but <laughs> yeah, I'm out of it. I'm fine, but you know, it, it 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 was pretty uh, hectic there over the news. But uh, I bet. <laughs> yeah, but I know you guys were having some problems with fires uh, back not too long ago. Yeah, well, that's what California gets. We get fires. Everybody always thinks it's earthquakes. That's not really earthquakes. Is so few and far between. It's really the fires are the things that are are uh, more disconcerting out here. That's for sure. Were you away from that? I am. I'm down. Uh, I'm down at the shore. So um, I'm right. You know, right along the beach. So that that I don't. I don't deal with much of that. Um, but uh, no, I got to say. I mean. Between the fires and the mudslides, that was uh, that was pretty harrowing. I had I had some friends lose their homes. I had one friend who got stuck in her house. Um, <clears throat> her ha entire house was swept away except for the staircase part of the second floor and a bathroom on the bottom floor, and she was in up to her neck in mud, stuck in the in the, in that bathroom downstairs for uh, almost almost a full day, while her child and her husband were stuck on the second floor above her. Oh wow. Pretty terrifying. Yeah, that's that that's a horror movie right there for you. That's that is terrifying. That is yeah. terrifying. Yep. yep. What well what what do you think? Jason goes to hell celebrates its twenty fifth <laughs> anniversary. What do you think about that time pass? I I, I, th I it almost stops my heart a little bit. Um, I mean, look. Uh, luckily, I was so young when I made the movie. I I don't feel so ancient right now. So that's terrific. Um, look, you know what I you know what what's great about about it hitting the 25th anniversary is that um, <clears throat> I think because of the internet and because there's so many people with an opinion, um, I see more about Jason Goes to Hell online now than I've ever seen. Yeah, um, I see more people debating it. I see more fans of it than I've ever seen before. I also, of course, see the haters of it, which is fine. Um, and I got to say, you know, I, I feel so proud of the legacy, um, not just of my film, but also of the Friday 13th films in general. The franchise is, is so beloved and so debated over. Um, you know, there are a lot of films, you know, the same weekend that my movie came out, a beautiful, amazing film called Searching for Bobby Fischer came out. Okay. And in fact, on opening night, I went and saw Searching for Bobby Fischer. I didn't see my movie. I, I had seen my movie enough. Um, I, pay I paid to see my movie, and I walked into the theater playing Searching for Bobby Fischer. <laughs> and Searching for Bobby Fischer is truly a masterpiece. It's, it's a remarkable film. Um, and no one talks about that film. No one remembers that movie. That movie gets passed over all the time where this, you know, tiny little horror movie that was in the theater right next door, people are still talking about and debating 25 years later. And that's, you know, that's amazing. That's, that's the thing that I think every filmmaker wants to have, is they want their work to, um, to sustain, whether loved, hated, debated, whatever. Um, I just think it's awesome that people are still talking about the film and that people still are interested in it. And I think that's really cool. Yes, and of course, uh, uh, getting into your background, you got your start really uh, working as what as a gopher on the original Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> for Sean, I worked for Sean Cunningham. Um, I've known Sean since I was a kid. Uh, his son Nolan and I were best friends when we were, when we were growing up, and um, 
you know, I was always sort of around Sean in his offices and, you know, doing anything I could do, office work, uh, you know, going and grabbing him tab because he drank tab back then. Um, and, yeah, I just uh, I came up to the ranks that way. And, in fact, Sean was incredi- inc- incredibly instrumental in, um, in helping uh, support m- the first theater company I opened when I was 15 years old. Um, you know, I did a lot of readings, table readings for Sean. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just, I was very lucky. I was really very, very lucky to, um, to live in such close proximity to, to Sean and his son, Noel. Um, and also, you know, Sean's wife or ex-wife, excuse me, uh, Susan, uh, Noel's mom, uh, was a remarkable editor, just extraordinary. And in fact, uh, you know, I learned a tremendous amount from her as well about storytelling and about how to put something together to tell a story. And, um, you know, you have to think back then in that household, you know, Steve Miner was there all the time. Wes Craven was there all the time. I mean, these were the people that were in many ways sort of my cinematic parents. Um, so I got a very early start. But my, my whole family has been in the business my whole life. There's, everybody is, uh, you know, there's a ton of actors and, uh, and, and, you know, Broadway and film and there's film directors. And, you know, so I've got a lot of I, my, my, my world was steeped in this kind of culture. And, uh, and so, you know, when I went to NYU, um, I won best picture there for a comedy that I made and I got two job offers. Uh, and one of those offers was from Sean Cunningham to come to LA and quote unquote, be his bitch for a year. And he would give me my shot. (laughs) <laughs> and uh you know i lived in my car for part of that time um i sold another script while i was there i set up another script with sean and disney for my good buddy uh dean laurie who wrote jason goes to hell with me mm-hmm. um and he had this picture called johnny zombie that we set up at disney that i brought out with me when i was living in the car and uh that movie ended up being my boyfriend's back which was released by disney pictures mm-hmm. so um, you know, so by the time I was, you know, 21, I had already set up a movie at Disney. By the time I was 23, uh, I was writing and directing, you know, my first feature film for New Line. And, you know, a tremendous amount of that has to do with the largesse of Sean Cunningham, who was, you know, back then, especially when I was a kid, was just tremendously supportive, really wanted, you know, wanted to shepherd um, what I was doing and, and give me a chance to, to, you know, to tell stories. So I was very lucky. Um, and, uh, but you know, look, I, I've been working in the business since I was 11. Yep. So, you know, it's like a lot of people want to go like, well, what the hell? He just got out of film school. How the hell does a guy like that get a movie? And it's like, well, um, <laughs> yes, I was young. I was 23, but I had already been working for a long time. Yeah. And when I was in New York, I worked in FX. I worked in, uh, in editing, uh, you know, I, I, I did a lot of stuff um, that got me where I was. Do, was I still incredibly lucky to get that shot? Absolutely. No choice about it. But, um, you know, I, 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 I made my bones to some degree. Yes. Um, so, yeah. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, the, the early start of all of that. I was wondering what you could tell us about uh, what was like on the set for the original Friday the 13th on, in 1980. Wow. Um, I, 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 my window is so tiny to it, um, <laughs> but I can tell you, look, here's the thing. At that time, the great thing about Sean was that he wasn't making a franchise. Everybody always thinks this is some sort of like larger picture thing. He was trying to make the net, he was trying to make a, a, a rip off of Halloween. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wanted to capitalize on that success as did a ton of other filmmakers. And so Sean was, um, you know, it was the early eighties. He had a lot of energy. He was very excited. Uh, and you know, Sean is, is, is a, um, kind of a tiny guy and he's sort of like a little firecracker. Um, and so there was this, uh, it was kind of sweet actually it was sort of a nice camaraderie um and there always was around sean he 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 definitely had a little bit of a pied piper thing to him um so my recollections while very very limited 
um, are, uh, are, are actually very sweethearted. Uh, and the people that I met, Tom Savini was awesome, mm-hmm. but he was like a god to me. You know, he was a guy that I would travel to, into New York to, uh, you know, to go to a signing of his. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, suddenly he's like, you know, he's picking me up and he knows my name. And, you know, it, 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 it's almost surreal, actually. Um, so, yeah, no, I was very I was very lucky. It was interesting because, you know, at that time they, you know, they went from making Friday 13th to a stranger's watching to spring break. So there were the, all these incredibly inappropriate movies for children to be around. <laughs> yep. Yet, yet I was around <coughs> them all the time. And, you know, I have... I, my my sharpest memories are things like, you know, when they, they, when, when they were making Spring Break, um, Susan Cunningham, N- Noel's mother, uh, came over to my home one day and knocked on the door. <laughs> I was like, hey, Noel's mom, what's up? Uh, and she was like, look, uh, my son's mu- taste in music is terrible. So um, you have good taste in music. Le- uh, what do you think should be on the soundtrack? <laughs> And I sat around with this incredibly generous, amazing woman, um, you know, going through my 45s. And to this day, I still have the 45s that she grabbed um, that are on that soundtrack. That those were the things that were chosen. Um, So it it was it was just sort of this cool dream factory sort of feeling. Um, I remember Noel and I. Uh, when Sean was making Friday the 13th, we, we started writing our first screenplay together. And again, we were 10, mm-hmm. 10 and 11 years old, and we're writing a screenplay. I mean, it's a terrible screenplay. I still have it. It's dreadful. Um, but that was the kind of um, atmosphere that Sean created and that it, well, everything was possible. Um, and so, you know, that's what I really remember about that time. You know, again, I was, I was really a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a, a lot of interviews from the Friday the 13th franchise. You're, you're my first from Jason Goes to Hell. Oh, well, I'm honored. I, by the way, I will tell you, the, the, you know, anybody you can get from the cast or crew on that film, the, I, I was blessed. We had an amazing team. And they're all pretty fascinating, amazing people. So... If you get anybody else, or if you ever want a heads up on somebody, let me know because they're they are uh, they're just super cool human beings, just great people. Well, perfect. I'll be reaching out yeah. to others from the cast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fr- from the original, of course, I had uh, Victor Miller on, of course, mm-hmm. a screenwriter. Yep. Yep, and he's, uh, he's a great guy. Yep, and uh, had a big crush on Adrienne King uh, back in those days. Uh, she still sure. looks lovely. Had her on the show. Mm-hmm. My second guest, and uh, I had Robbie Morgan on. And uh, do you remember them at all back in those days? Um, uh, less, I remember uh, Adrian very well um, because I was a little starstruck with her when I was when I was little. Um, I will tell you, I've seen Kevin Bacon several times since then as an adult. Mm-hmm. And when I when, when the first time I saw him, I, I believe I was just coming out of college, and I saw him in a screening, and I went up and talked to him for a minute. And it was amazing because I said, yeah, I'm Adam Marcus. I, I was that kid on set. And he was like, I remember you, Adam. I mean, it was so fast. <laughs> um, I was kind of blown away by that. So, uh, you know, yeah, I remember I remember a bunch of those people again, <laughs> you know, through 10-year-old eyes. But, yes. Um, I know we've uh, we've lost Walt Gorney, who played Crazy Ralph. And we've lost, unfortunately, yeah. Laurie Bartram. Do you have any memories of them at all? Uh, not of them. I, uh, Rex Everhart, who we've also lost, uh, who, who, um, you know, gives, uh, Annie her first ride Mm -hmm. before Mrs. Voorhees picks her up. Mm -hmm. Um, I dated his daughter in high school. Uh, he was, he was a West Porter. And so I know Rex, I knew Rex very, very well. He was, he was a, uh, just a lion heart of a man, just as lovely and, and amazing guy. He actually... Uh, he was on Broadway in Chicago, um, the original cast of Chicago. He played Mr. Cellophane um, and, and just a brilliant, brilliant actor. Uh, so out of, the, out of the supporting cast, he's the one I know the best of that group. Okay. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned Susan Cunningham. She went on to edit Friday the 13th Part 2. She sure did. Yep. And... Uh, you know, uh, Sean went on to do a Strangers, uh, Strangers Watching. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
No problem. Uh, yeah, I'm just getting over Thank a cold. <laughs> sure. But um, Sean is involved. What I, I hear mixed things about his involvement on uh, any of the sequels, especially uh, mm-hmm. parts two and three. Uh, is can yeah. you fill me in on anything there? Um, look again. Uh, my my knowledge base is somewhat limited in this area, but but I do have knowledge of it because I was around during that time. Look, Sean. Uh, okay, no one thought this thing was going to be a series of movies. That was unheard of. Um, and the fact that it happened only is the only reason that there was a, a Friday Thirteenth Part Two is because Friday Thirteenth made so much damn money. Um, <clears throat> Sean was integral to part two because Steve Miner uh, was Sean's protege. And Steve Miner was working with Sean even far as back as... Um, last House on the Left. Uh, last House on the Left, okay. right. So, so I remember Steve very well. And Steve, uh, in fact, funny enough, Steve's nickname uh, when Sean was working with him was The Kid. Okay. Um, uh, ten years later, when I was working with Sean, I got that moniker. I was called <laughs> The Kid. So I was told flat out, you've just gotten Steve's, Steve's nickname. And in fact, I cut my student film at NYU, the one that I won the awards for, with uh, Steve Miner and Susan Cunningham's original editing equipment. They gave me all of that. They passed that along to me. Um, so I know Sean was involved in that. His wife and Steve were directly involved with the sequel, and I think Sean... Sean's input was invaluable in creating that. And by the way, I will say, Friday the 13th Part Two is one of my favorite of the series. Yeah. I, I love th- that film. I think Jason actually, in a way, looks scarier with the burlock sap. Especially- I, I agree with you. Yeah. I, I, I truly agree with you, actually. And, and um, you know, when he was a little more the elephant man, yeah. um, there is something more frightening, I think, about this. Because, again, he was in the shadows. It wasn't so in your face. Um, yep. And whatever is in the darkness is always more scary than the thing that's just coming at you. Uh, but um, I, I will tell you, I know his involvement with the hockey mask was very limited. He, he's rewritten that history along the route so that he can take more credit for it. But quite frankly, um, you know, once once Mancuso came in, who, by the way, is a doll of a guy, mm-hmm. um, uh, once he came in, um, I worked with, my wife and I worked with him for, for quite a period of time. Um, I, I got to tell you, uh, it really wasn't Sean's series anymore. I'm not saying that he wasn't the exact producer. I'm not saying that he wasn't involved peripherally. He was. But, um, but you know, those movies really became Paramount's movies. And quite frankly, Sean was on to doing new things. I think Sean had other worlds to conquer. Quite frankly, you know, I, I think that the House movies... Uh, especially House 1 and 2, are really underrated gems. I think they're yep. great films. But again, Steve Miner, once again. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think Sean, look, you know, the, the, there, there is a, it's a double-edged sword when you have something like Friday the 13th because it suddenly defines the filmmaker you are in such a huge way. And there are so many great filmmakers who get stuck this way. Um, I think Sean, I think Wes, uh, Craven, I think John Carpenter, these are all people who I think had aspirations to actually make things <coughs> that would be, you know, Academy Award winner kind of pictures. Mm-hmm. And I think that, especially because of that time period, um, you know, horror was for the studios, you know, treated not dissimilarly to porn. Yeah. You know, it made a ton of money. It was the thing that the studios survived on, but they didn't want to talk about it. And, you know, I think, um, you know, Wes tried to break free of it with music from the heart and, mm-hmm. um, and did a you know, lovely job directing Meryl Streep, and she's amazing in the film. Um, but, you know, Wes had to go back to screen, and Wes had to do... But, I, but I'll tell you, you know, for my money, Wes's greatest stuff, um, and I love, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, and I love Hills Have Eyes, and I love his horror classics, but i got to tell you, Serpent of the Rainbow is uh, a masterpiece. Okay. That's a that's a remarkable piece of filmmaking. Um, so Wes had a lot of, a lot on his mind. Sean, I think, had a lot on his mind and wanted to tell stories. And I know this because Sean had a ton of scripts that we would do readings of that had nothing to do with the horror genre. That were just stories he really wanted to tell as a filmmaker. And the problem is, if it wasn't a horror movie, Sean had a really tough time getting things financed. 
What yeah. happened that he uh, ended up going from spring break to the new kids? Like, how how was he not right. able to uh, get back to, uh, well, you know, spring, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Spring break. <laughs> yeah. Spring break is porn. Yeah. Porn. <laughs> um, you know, you can you can slap any other label you want to on it. And by the way, I don't have, I, I have no opinion against pornography. It's fine. Um, but spring break is, is a TNA movie. It's just, it's literally wall-to-wall boobs, which, by the way, when you're 13 years old and you're hanging out in the editing room watching them cut that movie, at 13, it's the greatest thing that ever happened. I mean, I, I went through puberty in two months because of that movie. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but here's the thing. You know, uh, there were other films that Sean could have made instead of Spring Break, but mm, Sean made Spring Break. And that did not help his reputation from the standpoint of being an exploitation filmmaker. Yeah. So he goes to make The New Kids, which, again, The New Kids, you can tell he's trying to do something a step up. But I just, I, I don't feel, I, and again, this is just my opinion, but I, I feel like Sean, the, the die had been cast. And uh, I, I have to say, I personally think House. Um, gave him a little bit of a new lease on life. I think that movie did incredibly well. Mm -hmm. um, so much so there are four sequels, uh, or three sequels. Um, and, uh, and, and I wish that Sean had relied more on being that filmmaker because um, I got to tell you, you know, look, uh, whatever my personal feelings of Sean are, uh, what, uh, non -with notwithstanding, Sean is a remarkable producer. Yeah. Sean can get $20 out of a nickel. He just can. Um, and that is an amazing thing to watch somebody with that ability. He is so good on set. He is remarkable. Um, he, he just understands how to solve problems. And, um, you know, I've had my run-ins with Sean. Sean has, has, has not been kind to me over the years. Uh, but I, I have to say, I have to give the devil their due. The guy knows how to produce a movie just the truth yeah one thing i was of course talking to scotty mccoy about this who uh -huh. of course you're affiliated with and he's been yeah. on my show a couple of times uh, he's guy. he's delighted guy. that you like his book yep love it yeah i've got it too he um he and i were talking and we're both kind of in agreement with you here about the whole thing about well, there was a quote and i remember this i think back in fangoria when jason goes to hell first came out where where you were quoted as saying, I think it was in Fangoria, where you said that uh, Sean wanted the mask off of Jason. That the quote was, get that damn mask, hockey mask off of Jason. And uh, and then, then there's, uh, I know I've seen it online somewhere where Sean is denying saying this. Now, yeah. uh, you want to talk about this. Yeah, by the way, he doesn't just deny saying it. What he does is he called me a fucking liar. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he did this at a convention. Um, and forgive me, am I, is it okay that I... Oh, go I, ahead. Uh, when this goes on, okay. you don't worry about it. Okay, cool. I just didn't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, cause a problem for you. But, um, no, he, 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 uh, he did say that at a convention, and someone taped it, and there was applause for that. Uh, it's interesting, when you watch the video of that, because if you watch the video of him saying it, he immediately starts backpedaling. Yeah. Um, he realizes he said it. He realizes the audience has responded. And suddenly he's like, oh, wait a minute. And now he's done something on tape, in person. His face is on the tape. And look, here, here's, here's, here's my argument. And I, I've actually gone to, because I have a new film out right now that, that's in the festival circuit, and we're killing it in the festival circuit. So a lot of times people ask me questions about Jason Goes Tell, and this, this comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I have told people, get out your phones. Put this on YouTube, because this is a response to Sean. So here's the thing. I was 21, 21 when I started working on Jason Goes to Hell. Yep. Okay. I was a child. I was fresh out of film school. I was, you know, <laughs> arrogant and upstart and all those things. But I was 21. Sean Cunningham was not 21. And he was Sean S. Cunningham. Now, if we take Sean's premise, okay, either 
a 21-year-old filmmaker sauntered into Cunningham Productions. By the way, a guy living in his car sauntered into Cunningham Productions and told Sean Cunningham what was what. And we're going to get rid of that damn hockey mask, and that's the way it's going to go. Or, which, by the way, makes Sean a eunuch. Makes Sean the weakest man in Hollywood. Yeah. Or, or Sean Cunningham told me what to do with the movie and that I had to get rid of that goddamn hockey mask, which makes Sean the liar. Yep. So he can have either one. He can have column A or column B, because quite frankly, I look good either way. Either I am the strongest I was the strongest 21-year-old in the history of time to tell this, this Goliath of the, of the horror industry what he was going to do with the most iconic figure in the horror industry, which means I was just a badass. Or everything I've said is true, which, by the way, Sean has only debated in the last few years. He never said, I, he never said that was an accurate statement back when it was run in Tango in 1993. All right. Only, only in the last few years has he done that. And that's because Sean, <laughs> Sean loves to be the father of all successes. Yeah. He never wants to be the father of anything that he feels is either a failure or controversial. And the truth is, Sean loves money above all other things. And I mean all other things. Um, I had a wonderful relationship with Sean. I loved Sean very much. Sean really was like a second father to me. I cared about the man. And I am telling you, his love of money was the thing that destroyed that relationship. And I will tell you as well, you know, when you look at, you, you brought up Victor Miller, um, when you look at the problems that he's going through with Victor Miller right now, mm -hmm. I will tell you, there's not a writer in my industry that sides with Sean. Not one. Not one. Because, because anyone who's worked with Sean knows who Sean is. And I have seen Sean do this despicable things to writers despicable mm -hmm. um to good friends of mine i've seen him do despicable things um and all in the name of the almighty dollar and you know what <clears throat> at the end of his life sean will have some money but that's all sean's gonna have um and that is uh, sad because uh because i for one was someone who loved him very much um and uh and really did care about him and his family and and, and all that um and i'm telling you uh, Sean, Sean loves to do whatever that Sean thinks is going to make him a buck. And I remember saying this to him when I was 24, we were in post on the movie and Sean was, we were, we were having a conversation about a decision he was making about the film, uh, um, uh, my boyfriend's back. And Sean was really bending over backwards for the studio instead of standing up and fighting for what he knew was right for the movie. Yeah. And I remember looking at him going, but you're Sean Cunningham. And he made some snide remark. And I said, I said, you know what, Sean? I said, I'm sorry. You know, how is Joel Silver, Joel Silver and Richard Donner is Richard Donner. You, you think they're, they're those people because they said yes every time? Or do you think they're those people because they fought when they believed in something? Yeah. And look, I think at the beginning of Sean's career, he was that fighter. Um, I think a lot of people, when they get success, they suddenly, you know, they don't want to fight anymore. They, they want the easy road. And, um, and again, you know, <laughs> Sean called me a liar. I can flat out tell you I'm not lying. I have evidence from 1993 that backs up my statements to this day. And Sean did not balk in 1993. No. He was thrilled to take credit for it back then. Um, so, look, my integrity is sound. You know, ask Sean Cunningham how his integrity is doing. Because he lost his lawsuit to Victor Miller. Yeah, I just have yeah, I just have Victor Miller on and we didn't go into that off off yeah. conversation. He said he couldn't talk about it, which you know, which Absolutely. fine, you know. I honored yeah. that, but yeah. So well, I'm not I'm not look, I'm not bound by anything. And again, um, you know, I, I, I if, simply by knowing who Sean is, um, and again, as I said, one of the best producers I've ever worked with. He's remarkable in his craft. Uh, I wish that he was a nicer man. Well, uh, with v Victor Miller winning the lawsuit, what, what does that mean for the Friday the 13th franchise? Well, um, again, I don't know all the legalities of it. What I do know is that Victor owns Friday the 13th now. Okay. Uh, that, that is his. 
and Sean owns the hockey mask, which is a great irony, if, if you ask me. Um, Considering that he, <laughs> that was part three. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly, exactly, which is why Sean didn't like it. Yeah. He had nothing to do with the creation of that hockey mask. He loves to take, take credit for it now. He'll take credit for it now. But he really was not the father of the hockey mask. Steve Miner was the father of the hockey mask, and I'm sure to some degree Mancuso was the father of the hockey mask. Um, and look, and by the way, it's genius, I, and I do not disagree with it being genius. But by the way, let's, let's, <laughs> let's remember, the hockey mask is at the beginning of my movie. It's also at the end of my movie. I brought the hockey mask back. That was not a Sean Cunningham decision. That was an Adam Marcus choice. Yeah. Well, so, you, you know. Yeah. You probably would have gotten a lot of hate mail had you not. <laughs> Oh, I, look, by the way, I get hate mail anyway for, for not having it through the whole movie, which I think is actually silly. Um, because for me, uh, you know, how many times were people going to want to watch the same movie over and yeah. over and over and over? I, I, I couldn't do it. I, I, as a filmmaker, I couldn't do it. And by the way, forget as a filmmaker. As a fan, I couldn't do it. I love these movies. I mean, I really love these movies. And I love when people try to disparage that part of, of my background. It's like, no, guys, I grew up on these films in a way that most human beings didn't. Um, I love the Friday 13th franchise. I love every one of those movies. There are ones that I'm not as crazy about as others, without a doubt. I don't think Part 8 is a good movie. I don't. No. Sorry. I just don't. That's my opinion. Do you have any um, favorites? The what, uh, my, fa- my absolute favorite of all of them is Part 6, Jason Lives. Oh, I love it, too. I've interviewed five people from that movie. It's a terrific film. It's a terrific film. Yeah. Um, and Tom is a really good filmmaker. And, I, I mean, it's just, it's just a great movie. Yeah. Um, and, look, you know, the other thing is, you know, I wanted to have, speaking of Part 6, I wanted my lead character played by Stephen, uh, by um, John D. LeMay in, 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 uh, in Jason Goes to Hell. I wanted that character to be Tommy Jarvis. I wanted it to be Tommy's continuing story. The problem is, is that New Line didn't buy Tommy. They bought Jason. Oh. They didn't even, they didn't even buy Friday the 13th. So again, these rights are now so splintered. My, my gut feeling is this is the end of the, this is the end of the road. Um, I don't think, Friday 13th comes back again. Um, and it's, it's devastating because I think the fans want it. Yeah. I know I want it, you know. Um, but I think that, again, greed has uh, reared its ugly head. And, um, and it's kind of screwed the, screwed the pooch. I'm surprised they haven't done a Jason in winter yet. <laughs> Could you imagine uh, know, him breaking out of the ice? I know there was a draft of it that, that was, that was going to be Jason in, in winter. Yeah. So I know there was a draft of that. That would have been interesting seeing him bust out of the uh, ice covered lake. Sure. Yeah. yeah. We actually, we, uh, Dean Laurie and I wrote a promo for Jason goes to hell, um, that we wanted to have come out before the movie, which was a bunch of kids skating on crystal lake. Um, and they were going to play hockey. And suddenly Jason kind of drifts onto the ice, kind of lumbers onto the ice with the kids. Uh, and they, they, start, they start playing, and they, they hit the puck to Jason, and Jason just takes off one of these kids' heads. Yeah. And that was going to be the, uh, the promo for Jason Goes to Hell. That was, that was what we wanted to shoot originally. Um, <laughs> New Line said no, be, not because they didn't like the idea. They said no because we're not going someplace where there's snow and skating. <laughs> I was like, okay, got it. Wow. Yeah, that but, was the original promo. That was the first thing we wrote. Yep. Do you, is there any, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I was wondering if there's any of the, any of the sequels uh, that Sean was not involved with that he liked at all. Um, you know, I don't really know, actually. I got to tell you, I mean, he did not like Part 8. Boy, did he not like Part 8. Uh, and we talked about it a lot because, um, you know, they promised Jason takes Manhattan. Yep. Um, and then Jason took a boat ride. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like uh, that's uh, kind of lame advertising. Um, and by the way, someone could also say Jason goes to hell. Well, he goes to hell in the last minute of the movie, which, by the way, is the point. But I can understand someone saying, I want to see Jason in hell killing people. <laughs> like, OK, um, but 
Jason takes Manhattan sounds like Jason is actually going to take Manhattan, that he's going to be there. And I don't know if you remember the promo for Jason takes Manhattan. It's extraordinary. It's okay. Yeah. Teaser. Yeah. Yeah. The teaser trailer. I do remember it. Oh yeah. With Jason standing on the Jersey side of the Hudson river, looking at New York and the camera's slowly going in on his back and they're playing New York, New York, Sinatra's New York, New York. And then uh, at the last moment, Jason turns around, you see his face and the audience went berserk. And mm-hmm. then, you know, Jason went to Montreal and spent, you know, 30 seconds in Times Square. That's, that's what he did in Manhattan. Um, so, no, I don't remember Sean really being complimentary. I do know he liked part two very much. I know we talked about part two quite a bit. He liked it? Um, yes, he liked part two very much. Very okay. Much. Um, as we all did. It's, uh, look, it's, part two is an energetic, smart, well-acted movie. I think part four is a terrific film. Oh, yes. It's a terrific movie. I uh, like Ted you. White a lot as Jason. Yes, I do too. Yeah. Yeah. I really do. But um, I'm partial. I'm most partial to Kane. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's not just because he's in my movie, which, which he's fucking great in my movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing about Kane, um, Kane takes playing that character as seriously as Robert Englund takes playing Freddy. Um, yes, there is there there is a real he, Kane. You know, uh, while Kane is an, a magnificent stunt coordinator and 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 performer, um, Kane is an actor first. Yeah, um, and Kane is uh, he is in character from the second that makeup goes on to the second it comes off. He is he is he is Jason, um, which is actually pretty frightening for for people on set. I mean, he is so in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you're, you know, I, I watched him back people up quite, quite a lot. Um, but he's brilliant at it and he loves it and his dedication is extraordinary. Well, I do know this, uh, T- uh Ted White was my oldest interview guest and, um, he, um, he was my oldest interview guest and he's my only Jason interview right now that I've had, oh, but boy, what okay. a great great set of uh, all these people he worked with and yeah i really like ted white and he uh, was very complimentary about kane hodder as well i'm sure uh, th- you know what though those guys are all really good with each other they all show up the conventions together and mm-hmm. they do signings together they're really good dudes so i'm not surprised by that yeah yeah but um no getting back to the hockey mask though um i know there was one convention i saw and again uh, don't quote me on this, but I did see it on YouTube, where Sean was at a convention. There was Kane Hodder. There was Steve Dash, who played Jason in Part 2. Yeah. And, of yeah. course, um, Steve Dash was talking about the sack, the burlock sack, and how it was hard to get that thing so they could see out of it. I think Sean made a comment about the, how stupid the sack was or something of that mm-hmm. nature. Again, yeah. uh, I, I would have to find it, and uh, so if somebody no, 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 finds I've it... Seen, I've seen the clip. I've seen the clip. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, um, uh, you know, Sean is... Um, Sean's real good at poking holes in everybody else's work. Yeah. That's, that's kind of who Sean is. So, yep. He, he said it. He sure did. Yeah, okay. Um, but I look, you know, again, what, and Sean said this to me very early on in my career. He said, you know, I said, you know, what are we going to do next? What, you know, what films are we going to do next? And he said, Adam, in six months, you're going to be too big to be working with me. And I was like, what? 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 And he said, that's what happens. You know, I start people off and then they go have real careers. And, you know, I think he feels that some way about Steve Miner. I, I, I think he feels that about a number of people that he's worked with. And uh, I think that's a shame. That's a shame. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? Um, I watched uh, Jason Takes Manhattan today before I came okay. into this because I, I wanted to connect between that and Jason Goes to Hell. I got to say, probably the biggest compliment I can call, call for Jason Takes Manhattan I love Peter Mark Richmond in the film, a great veteran actor, and I think he brought more to the film than uh, it probably deserved. Right. Yep. And uh, he was really nice to interview. But, uh, huh? Good. I said that's great. Yep. But um, 
there is an interesting little disconnect between, like, uh, number one, I don't quite grasp what happened at the end of Jason Takes Manhattan. You see no, him as no a boy one, in no the sewer. And, uh, no, no one does. No one knows what happened at the end of that movie. No, no one knows. They, yeah. They, they, a lot of supposition. I, I will tell you this. I was told to ignore it. I was told to ignore its existence. Okay. Yeah. You told that by Sean? Yes, Absolutely. Okay, because there's a, a lot of people are saying what happened between that movie and Jason Goes to Hell. What happened was the guy who created the first movie came in to make the next movie and went, um, "Yeah, forget that that movie exists." <laughs> That's what happened. That is that is the that is the, the canon backstory on that one. <laughs> he, he just uh, he found the movie ridiculous and uh, and told us to completely ignore it. Myself and Dean Laurie, who wrote the script with me. Well, you know what? I gotta say, for Jason Goes to Hell, yes. my favorite part of the movie, and I gotta say, this was brilliant. Your opening prologue part there, uh, Thank I thought that was brilliant because it's so Thank unexpected. You. Well, thank you. That's that's terrific. Um, look, that was actually I, I gotta say that was one of the most fun things to not only to to, to shoot but also to write because. Um, the reason that all came about was because uh, Dean and I had written versions of the opening and tried different things. And Sean brought in a bunch of his buddies that we all kind of sat in a round table and kind of beat up the opening of the film until we ended up with something that we really loved. I remember there's a guy named Lewis Abernathy. Uh, Lewis wrote and directed House, or no, he directed, he co-wrote and directed House 4. For Sean, okay, uh, and I worked. I were. I was a PA on that movie when I was uh, 21, and um, Lewis is a great, great guy. He's um, he's a good friend of James Cameron. He's in Titanic. Um, he plays Bill Paxton's sidekick in Titanic. He's sort of a burly, good-looking guy with a big beard. Okay. Um, anyway, Lewis. Uh, Lewis was actually someone who started the conversation about about bringing in the feds. And my response, what, where I wanted to come from with the movie was, I, I, I said, okay, if this movie exists in the, in, in, in the universe as we know it, um, there have been over 100 killings in less than a 10-year period in a, an area with a radius of about a mile. Okay. Um, that's a serial killer. The feds come in. So the funny thing about the opening of that movie was it was completely based in logic. Mm -hmm. Like, if this many people died in this small an area, <laughs> the feds would be there. That's not a local law enforcement problem. That's a serial killer and a mass serial killer. So, um, so that was why, you know, look, it's not only why we had a federal sting at the beginning of the movie to open the film, but it's also why... You know, the local restaurant has Jason Burgers, or, uh, you know, Voorhees Burgers and Jason Fingers. Do you, do you now, still make Jason Burgers? Uh, you know what's amazing? This is actually crazy to guess. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I am actually, I am writing the foreword to a cookbook, to a horror cookbook right now. Oh, well, um, it's, I'm trying to think. There is a guy that does that, uh, uh, Zazu. Um. Oh, I can't remember the name of the guy because I think Adrian King talked about him as well. Uh, this is—it's not the same guy. Oh, it's okay. Not the same guy. This is this is a um, uh, a couple uh, that I met at the Phoenix Film Festival a couple months about a month ago um, when uh, when I showed uh, Secret Santa there for the Phoenix Film Festival, and they are huge fans, and they sent me their recipes, all of their recipes. So I went through this stuff and they're fantastic recipes, uh, but they had, you know, Voorhees burgers and Jason fingers. Um, and, uh, th but th their whole cookbook is different films, foods. Um, and so they asked me if I would write the forward for the book. And I was like, I absolutely will. I think you're, I think the recipes are amazing. Um, so it's funny that you bring that up because yes, I, I do make Jason Burgers and Warriors. I mean, uh, Jason Figures and Warriors Burgers. I do make them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think the opening of that movie was phenomenal, and of course, Kate Kane Hodder. I gotta say, I feel really, and I'm I know a lot of fans agree with this. Why the frig they didn't bring him back for J Jason or Freddy versus Jason? I don't know, but I know Kane was bitter about it, and I don't blame him. Oh yeah, 
No, I don't. I don't blame him either. And 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 the fans are right. Look, you know, the performance in Freddy versus Jason is fine. It's fine. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's a guy wearing a hockey mask and he's a stunt man. I get it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that uh, Ronnie Yu wanted um, an actor who was larger than uh, than than Robert Englund. He wanted much much taller. And while Kane is larger than Robert Englund, he doesn't tower over him. So I know that was the problem. I think it was an incredibly short-sighted decision, and I think it hurt the film. I mean, the movie made a lot of money, yeah. but fans fans are pretty bitter about Freddy vs. Jason, um, and I and I get why. I mean, there's you know, there is a, a there's a love of Kane in that role, and it's deserved. I mean, he. You know, he did four of the movies. Yep. And he's, and he's fantastic in those movies. Even if you don't like the films, he's still the best Jason. He just is. Um, and it's, uh, no, I thought it was disrespectful to the fans. I really do. I really do. Yep. Well, it definitely came from somebody that uh, didn't quite, uh, well, apparently he only had seen, the uh, Ronnie Yu had only seen the original Friday the 13th and the original Nightmare on Elm Street. So I'm like, Seriously. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, again, uh, you know, I, I I think you have to know these movies, even if you want to twist the mythology. I think you have to know the franchise, and uh, I think it's a shame when directors are hired who have no interest in the franchise. Yeah, I think that's a shame. Well, I that's think Tom McLaughlin really got into it whenever he did Jason Lives. You know, he he had the spirit. I don't know why he yeah. didn't do another one. You know. Well, I think he wanted to do other things in his band. And, you know, I mean, I think he's, you know, he, look, uh, again, you know, uh, I was, uh, I went in to talk about Freddy versus Jason right after my film. Yeah. Um, but I have to tell you, you talk about too many cooks in the kitchen. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, there were a lot of people making decisions on that movie. And, and, and again, you know, the movie that they ended up with, while I think it's fun, um, it feels like a movie put together by a committee. Yes, I I can see your point there, yeah. but I gotta say though I think uh, Kane Hodder does probably his best work as Jason in Jason Goes to Hell. <coughs> Thank you. And um, I I'm I'm partial to it myself. I think he's fantastic in the movie. Yes. He also gets to be he also gets to be himself in the movie. He plays you know the the, the federal agent. Yeah, I know. He calls himself a pussy. Exactly. <laughs> He was so in love with that when, when we wrote that line for him. He was so excited to do that. And then he's also Freddy Krueger at the end of the film. Okay. It's his hand in the glove that pulls his own mask down. He's really beating himself up. He really is. He played three roles in that movie. Well, there we go. But um, i got to say, um, one of the things I really liked about uh, the, the look of Jason and uh, Jason Goes to Hell... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they say you combined his look from part seven and part two. And I got to say, in part two, I love the fact that he had hair on like half of his head, <laughs> you know, when, uh, when you finally get to see him with the sack off. And uh, was that uh, the inspiration for his look in uh, part nine? Absolutely. Um, the, look, the other thing is, is that we were, um, we were not going to um, – show his face that was never going to be part of the option we i because my feeling was i wanted the mask to have been on his face so long and for so much damage to have to occurred and because he was a you know quote unquote zombie uh by that point i wanted the mask to literally have been embedded in his face mm-hmm. and become his face uh because to me the minute you pull the mask off of monster it's nowhere near as scary anymore it becomes silly and yeah. so I wanted this hideous thing underneath never to be exposed. So the idea of the flesh growing over the mask was sort of the first idea. Um, yes, part two was incredibly inspirational. But I got to tell you, look, I mean, you know, Bob Kurtzman of, uh, you know, back then of K&B effects, Bob Kurtzman is one of my best friends for the last 25 years or actually 27 years. Um, and Bob, um, you know, Bob did all the effects on the movie with KNB, but he was he was the lead guy. He was also my my second unit director. Um, I hired Bob as, as the second unit director on the film, and Bob to this day does all of my movies, does all my effects, does all the stuff that, that I'm doing now with my new company, Skeleton Crew. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I will tell you, I mean, 
there was one point when Sean passed the two of us. We were working uh, together, and Sean passed us, and he, he, he heard us. He came back into the room, and he went, he went, you know, it's like two little kids playing in a sandbox. <laughs> and it's really true because we really were like little kids playing in a sandbox. Like, we were having so much fun on every design element of this movie. Every kill was like a new opportunity for us to just go nuts. And my whole concept with it was go for broke. Like, don't do anything half-ass. It's, we got to go all in. Um, and look, you know, I, the people who get what I was trying to do really love the movie and really appreciate, you know, where I was going. The people who don't get it, don't get it. And that's cool. But I, I swung for the fences, as did Bob. And the look of Jason um, is sort of indicative of how we swung for the fences. I mean, that... that Poor Kane Hodder was in a suit from head to toe. There was not an inch of him that wasn't covered in that makeup. Uh, and he, in fact, it had a cool suit inside of it. You know what that is? I think so. So it's tubes of water that run in the latex that we put freezing water through so that Kane wouldn't hyperventilate and wouldn't, wouldn't die from heat exhaustion inside the, inside the outfit. That's how covered he was. Oh, Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was an unbelievable suit. And by the way, you know, that opening sequence when we do, when we end up shooting uh, Kane and, you know, firing all those bullets into him and then blowing him up, mm -hmm. um, when we shot into him, it's the most squibs ever put on a human being in a movie. Oh, wow. He had 178 squibs on him. <laughs> and again, you talk about commitment. I mean, that's the thing about Kane. Kane was like, load him up. I'm ready to go load them up. Yeah, I love that, and too. Like Especially you could see the sparks on the machete, too, oh, yeah. with some of the bolts oh, hit yeah. that. Oh, yeah. We, we, and again, there's no CGI in that sequence. There's no, it, it didn't exist. Um, in fact, all of the stuff that happens at the end of the movie when heaven opens up and hell opens up and all that, uh, an incredibly talented guy named Al Magliacetti um, is the one who did all of that stuff. And he, that is hand rotoscoped work. That is animated. Every bit of that is animated. There were no computers to do that for us. Um, so, no, when you see all those sparks and everything, that's people, that, that, is, that is little explosives on, on the machete to go off and, and show that he's being shot. Wow. And, of yeah. course, you hear Jason, like, groaning, too, you know? Actually, you actually hear me groaning. Oh, that's you. That is my voice. I, I am the voice of Jason Voorhees in the movie Jason Goes to Hell. Uh, when we were doing the ADR on the film, <laughs> Sean didn't want to bring all the actors back to do their ADR. So he, uh, so he had myself, Dean Laurie, and my girlfriend at that time, now my wife for 25 years, uh, Deborah Sullivan. Uh, the three of us did all of the voices for oh, wow. <laughs> almost everything. And all of that getting shot, all the groaning, all that, that is all me doing that. Yeah, I think the only other time I remember him groaning is when Amy Steele kicked him in the nuts in part two. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, true. it's true. But again, I, you know, look, uh, you know, Jason at that, and I, I know a lot has been written about it, but it's, it, it was true at the time. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things I couldn't advertise at the time. But, you know, I wanted to create a much more interesting character with Jason where it wasn't just the shark in the water, but that the shark in the water was sentient, that he had, that, that there was a, a thought process there. And, you know, that's why I put the Necronomicon in the movie. That's why I asked Sam Raimi for the Necronomicon. Um, it's why the dagger is in there. It's why there's a ton of connections to Evil Dead, uh, mm -hmm. because I was in my own sneaky way trying to connect the Evil Dead franchise to the Friday the 13th franchise. Wouldn't it be great if they did the uh, J Freddy versus Jason versus Ash movie? It'd be fantastic, and it should happen. And they've been talking about it ever since I made Jason Goes to Hell. Um, so, you know, I love when people go, oh, that's not true. You know, it's not Adam is just making that up. No, Adam's not making that up. I, <laughs> there's a reason I put all those props in the movie um, in the Voorhees house. There's a reason that dagger is used to kill Jason. Um, you know, I really did want to connect those worlds. Um, because I, because again, I'm a big fanboy. Like I, I want, you know, I, I was the kid who was more turned on by Godzilla versus King Kong as a kid, you know, because it's like, who doesn't want to see their favorite wrestlers get in the ring? 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Except most of my favorite wrestlers are passing away now. <laughs> That's true. That is true. But uh, I was, was going to say, though, um, I wonder how uh, Bruce Campbell would fare against... <laughs> Well, I think it'd be fun to watch, though. I think that'd be a fun that that's a fun battle royale to watch. I hope they I hope it gets made. Well, we'll see. I know that Bruce is saying he's hanging up the ash boots for good. That that's over. Yeah, I think he can change his mind. <laughs> yeah, he can. He can. And I think if they gave him enough money and they gave him a good a good enough script, I think he would. Yeah, I love Bruce. I do too. He's an amazing guy. Yeah. But yeah, that opening scene was great. And I gotta say, you know, starting off there, Julie Michaels really, really looked hot, especially even when she had the ball cap on. You know, when she shows up yeah. there, she looks stunning, and of course, a stunt woman herself. Yep, and an amazing, amazing woman, amazing actress. She's just, she is a lovely, lovely person. I'm crazy about Julie. Yeah, well, I love that opening with her, too, you know. Like, everything is typical in that opening mm -hmm. until that mm -hmm. twist. Yep, that's the idea. Yep, and I, I love that. And, uh, and of course, you uh, had mentioned uh, John D. LeMay. Now, uh, mm -hmm. yep, so you, you weren't able to get Tommy Jarvis. I never heard that story that you wanted to bring Tommy back. Yeah, I wanted I, I you know I wanted to have that be the character and uh, and see that Tommy's life is sort of stalled and that you know ever since Jason's gone he you know he's kind of drifting and suddenly you know Jason coming after the woman he's in love with uh, and his baby um, you know brings him back into the fold of getting rid of Jason and Creighton Duke is the one guy who actually has studied the mythology to figure out how to get rid of it so I really wanted it to be that story. Uh, and Paramount said, nope, can't have Tommy. Sorry. Uh, were you in talks to have Tom Matthews back? Uh, we weren't in, to in talks to have Tom Matthews back because we couldn't get a past script stage. So oh. when we were working on the screenplay, we were flat out told you can't have Tommy. Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, it that's is unfortunate. unfortunate. And yeah. I love Tom Matthews. I'm a huge fan. Oh, yeah. I've had him on the show. Uh, great guy. Great guy. But uh, John D. LeMay, you know, for the price of some... Did you have to break his fingers to give him the part? <laughs> <laughs> John, John's awesome. John and I are still friends to this day. And I, I got to tell you, the thing about John was that he's such a serious thespian. I mean, he's a Chicago-raised actor, um, and he is a, a serious theater cat. And, uh, you know, he took it very seriously here's the thing about here look here's the thing about jason goes to hell and it's one of those things that that most people don't know you know i rehearsed that movie for months before we shot and my actors showed up to rehearse mm -hmm. um you know and again i was still i mean even with my actors i was still the youngest person on set and the all of these you know professionals would show up and work with this child directing them but I wanted them to have real rehearsal. I wanted, I treated it the way I would treat a piece of theater. And I was lucky enough to have a cast that was professional and that loved the, the, the loved their craft enough that they were like, wait a minute, we're being offered rehearsal time with the director? Yeah, I'm there. So I had a ton of rehearsal with my actors. It was amazing. It was an, it was an amazing thing. Um, and John is, uh, you know, he's one of those guys, he... He he really turned Stephen uh, Stephen Freeman into Hamlet. Yeah, he gets into a nice fight scene too at the end of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How much of that was him? I mean, we know that Kane does his own stunts. How did, how much of the physicality was John D. Levine? John did a surprising amount of it, but there were two stuntmen who who stepped in for him for things like uh, there was a young Asian stuntman who was uh, very wiry who got thrown into the um, the jungle gym. Okay. Um, but that was a specialty moment. Uh, there was another stuntman who uh, who got beat up a couple times. But I got to tell you, John, you know, John knows his theater craft and was able to take a lot of those hits. So a lot of that is John. He, he was really resilient, resilient guy. Yeah, and of course, uh, I, I I always said this. I always, my favorite part of the Friday the 13th movies was the females. I always had a 
favorite female in every single one of the movies, you know? In fact, here's a story. I've shared this with Adrian King. I've shared this with uh, Melanie Kinneman. I've shared this with Laura Park Lincoln. Um, the first one of the franchise I saw was part two. And my cousins baited me into watching it, even though at that time I did not like horror movies. Now, I would have been in my really, really young teens at that time. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I, I watched it to prove that I could face my fear. But sure. I remember the one scene where my mom came in and turned the television off was when Kirsten Baker strips down... It <laughs> goes into the lake. It was the first time I had sure. seen a naked woman. Ah. <laughs> it was in that film. <laughs> and uh, one day I hope they made to tell her that. <laughs> but, That's great. But, for, for, no. you know, for me, for me, you know, Amy Steele was, um, I just, I loved her work. I, I found her so pretty and mm-hmm. so relatable and, and really amazing in that film. And I also have to say, uh, you know, I'm I'm friendly with uh, personally, and 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 I just love Deborah Voorhees. Oh yeah, uh, I've had her on twice. She's just God. She's just the best. Yeah, just the best. Oh, I love great, Deborah Voorhees. Lovely woman, just a lovely woman. Yeah. yeah, I've had good connections. Still have good connections with a lot of the cast, you know. And uh, sure. Sure. Yep, but yeah, I'm still in touch with Deb- Debbie Sue and Melanie Kinneman from Part Five, and uh, mm-hmm. and a variety of people. Like, uh, but um, yeah, but you brought in Carrie Keegan. I don't know what Carrie's doing now. What is she still acting? No, no, she's not. Carrie is uh, is a mom, um, and uh, I'm pretty proud mom. Um, she's uh, no, she's got a very kind of lovely life outside of the business. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can tell you, um, you know, the person that I had the best connection with of the girls in in the movie, and I and I really was very close with most of my cast. But the person that I became really close friends with was Allison Smith. Oh, I like her. Um, she's. I got to tell you, man. Um, again, you know, you, you just uh, for me, it's about the craft and about how seriously people take their craft. Um, she is about the most. Uh, committed, stunning young actor uh, at that time that I that I was involved with. She was just so good at what she did and so serious, but also so much fun to be on set with. I was crazy about Allison Smith. I um, felt we were... so bad when she got off. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's actually the saddest. I think it's the most painful, saddest death in the movie because you're really cheering for her. I mean, when she pulls up that shotgun, come on now. I mean, yep. she's badass. Um, and she really tries to protect that baby and her friend. Uh, and so to me, that's a real hero. And so it becomes a real tragedy at that point. She is, she was a magnificent actor and just a lovely, lovely woman to have around. So no, I was very blessed. Also, you know, um, speaking of the ladies, Rusty Schwimmer, uh, we're still close and Rusty is, uh, I mean, you talk about a ferocious actress, just so good. And it's funny because the thing about about the character she played, Joey B, Joey B was written for a man. Oh, she was hilarious. She brought great and deal of comic relief to the movie. Absolutely, her her and Leslie Jordan and and the guy who played their son, Adam Craner, mm-hmm. who Adam was one of my closest friends since we were eleven years old. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I uh, no, I was very blessed. My cast. Uh, I mean, Stephen Culp is amazing, and Billy Greenbush is terrific, and Aaron Gray. I mean, you can't, you just don't get, you don't get a better person to work with. I mean, How did you get Aaron Gray into the movie? <laughs> Her uh, son loved these movies. He loved uh, effects, and he loved horror movies, and it's the only reason she came to see me. Uh, the, the two people that came in to see me that I was really blown away by um, were her and Tippi Hedren. They're the two women that came in for that part that I was like, you're kidding me. They're going to actually talk to me? Um, what, Tippi? <laughs> yes, yeah, Tippi came in. And I got to tell you, what was amazing about Aaron was that when, I, when, when we talked about doing the film, I said to her, I said, look, I said, Aaron, I said, I'm, I'm sitting with you because, I, one, I'm a you know, lifetime fan of yours. 
Um, I was a child when Buck Rogers came out, and I was just crazy about her, um, and also Silver Spoons. Uh, but I said to her, I said, you know, Erin, I, I get the sense that, you know, because you started as a model, that when you get hired as an actor, you're treated like a model. And she kind of smiled and was like, yeah, that's, that's really true. I said, well, I don't want to do that. I said, I can tell you, um, if you're comfortable with it, I would rather you wear almost no makeup in the film. I, I want this to be you. I said, I'm not looking for you to be a model. I'm looking for you to be the mother in this film, the, um, the heroine of the first half of the movie. Um, I want people to see your acting. I don't want them to see how pretty you are. You are pretty. That's a fact. But I don't want this to be about that. I want this to be about your work. And I think me saying that <laughs> made her sign on the dotted line for the movie. Um, <laughs> and I meant it. I meant every word of it because she's, um, she's a terrific actress and no one was giving her the chance to be a terrific actress. How close were you to signing Tippy? Uh, I have, to, I love Tippy and she gave a great reading, but I have to tell you <laughs> once Aaron Gray walked in the room, there was nobody else for the part. Cause Tippy, you get into Hitchcock territory. Absolutely. And funny enough, the, the, um, the jungle gym at the end of the film yeah. is from the birds. Oh, wow. Right uh, we got it from Universal Props. They gave it to us. Oh, wow. Uh, every, I wanted every prop in this movie to have some connection to the horror world. So I kept trying to find those kind of props. But that's where it came from. Oh, wow. Yep. Yep. So yeah. I was already in Hitchcock territory. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and if you want to get into how pretentious I was at this time, because, wow, was I pretentious. Um, the original name of the film was Friday the 13th, The Heart of Darkness. This was before I, I knew, uh, before I found out I couldn't use Friday the 13th. But that was the working title of the movie, Friday the 13th, The Heart of Darkness. The reason I called it The Heart of Darkness was because I knew I was going to be 23 when I was directing the film. Orson Welles was 23 when he was going to be directing his first film, which was an adaptation of Joseph Campbell's The Heart of Darkness. Oh, Wow. So that is why the original title of the movie was Jason, was uh, Friday Thirteenth: The Heart of Darkness. Oh wow, clever! Uh -huh. yep. But but yeah, going back to the diner scene, yeah, Rusty yeah. Swimmer was yeah. funny, uh -huh. and and Leslie jo Leslie Jordan I heard had some issues uh, in doing the film. Would you like to elaborate on that? The uh, the only issue Leslie had because we had a great time. Leslie and I got along famously, and uh, we did a lot of really good work together. Mm -hmm. The problem that Leslie had, and it's been blown up over the years, it's become like a, a little bit of a legend. But the problem is was Leslie's death. So um, I wanted to use Leslie as much as I could in his death, scene. and so when he got shoved into the fryer, okay, um, we were going to put soda into the fryer and then make it bubble, make it, you know, give it this rapid boil. So it would look like boiling oil when it was just soda. So we asked Leslie what his favorite soda was. He told us we filled it with that soda and he got dunked into the, into the fryer. Okay. Okay. Um, he didn't like the experience of that. That's it. That's literally the controversy. He didn't like being shoved in the fryer, um, which I could totally understand. Uh, I think we shot it two times. Um, and it was done. So um, he was uncomfortable for that. It wasn't fun for him. He didn't like that. Uh, but that is truly the controversy of the movie. That's, that's it. <laughs> that was the problem for Leslie. Yeah, they made it sound uh, like he didn't like the movie. No, that, I, that I, I've never gotten that from I've never heard that from Leslie, and I've never gotten that from Leslie. Okay. Um, I know that he, that he did not like being shoved into that fryer. That was, that was the thing he was not happy about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Again, these these things evolve over time mm -hmm. and become like bigger deals. Um, but it's uh, there was never any, and at least as far as I'm concerned, there was never any evidence of that. Uh, he just did not like being shoved into that fryer. Well, you had uh, a lot of interesting kills in that movie. I think one that stands out to me is the woman being split in half in the tent. <laughs> it's, it is considered by many uh, to be the best kill in the Friday the 13th franchise, that it's the number one kill. Even over the sleeping bag? <laughs> yep, 
<laughs> and over the sleeping bag. Yes, sir. <laughs> yep. Because, again, look, the sleeping bag is incredibly inventive, and I love that kill. But uh, I will tell you, when people see the unrated cut of Jason Goes to Hell, mm -hmm. the, sleeping, the sleeping bag gets left in the dust. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that was a really gross kill. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. But um, what? Uh, tell me about uh, of all the effects in the movie, and you had a ton of yeah. them. What would you say was the most difficult one that 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 was to 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 do, especially with the kills? Um, yeah, because I I, uh, I will tell you, all the puppeteering stuff was very tough in the movie, which had nothing to do with the kills. Mm -hmm. um, with the demons and all that towards the end of the film. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think if there were any really difficult difficult uh, moments with the effects. There really weren't. Like, uh, things moved so seamlessly, so easily on set. Um, you know, we, we shot a ton of stuff in, in not a very long time. And, uh, and again, I had Bob Kurtzman, who was an ace. Mm -hmm. um, even the, the girl split up the middle, we shot it twice, we were done. Um, so no, I, I don't remember, I don't remember a kill being particularly arduous. Um, I will tell you when we blew Jason up, when we actually blew him up at the beginning of the film, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I was really young and really enthusiastic and, um, and I was standing too close to the blast zone. Uh, and that explosion went off and my monitor, which was on a stand, you know, it was on a C stand. My monitor flew into my chest, and I rocketed back and slammed into a van. Oh. Um, shot me back about 10 feet um, because I was just too close to the bus. So I was so excited. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was knocked myself out. But, um, no, i got to tell you, that it, was, uh, it was actually a weirdly easy shoot when it came to the effects. The effects were, were very easy to play out. They really weren't. Yeah, uh, and you had quite a lot of nudity in the movie, too. Sure did. <laughs> yeah. Sure did. I heard there was some issues with Carrie Keegan and nudity. You want to expand yeah. on that? Um, I can. Um, you know, look, uh, Carrie was uh, very young, and mm -hmm. Carrie was, uh, it was her first movie. Yeah. And it was my first movie. And um, unbeknownst to all of us, Carrie agreed to do the nudity at the beginning of the film. She agreed when we hired her. We told her it was part of the job. And she agreed to it. Um, she had never intended to do it. She, did, she was never going to do it. Um, but her agent, uh, who was not a very lovely man, um, had told her, well, just shoot the first three days, and then they can't, they can't fire you because they can't afford to reshoot. Wow. So... Uh, so she did that. Um, and then uh, she started doing a lot of sort of um, not great things on set. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of that. But, sure. um, but it was it was you know, it was not great. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's sad because I have a really good relationship with pretty much everyone for the film. And by the way, Carrie and I buried the hatchet over the years. We're, we're fine. Um, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm very loyal to my actors. I love my actors. They're, they're, they're to me the most important part of the filmmaking process for a director. And, um, you know, I, I try to stay really good with the people that I work with and, and show them respect and show them that I love them. And Carrie created an environment because she was so upset about doing nudity. And again, when she, when she said she didn't want to do it, my first reaction was, okay, let me get a body double for you and you can choose the double. Like I'll let you choose. Oh, and wow. She wouldn't allow, she wouldn't allow it. She Why allow not? It. And well, because she, because quote unquote, my father is going to see this film. <laughs> and, and I thought, I thought you're in, you're in a Friday the 13th movie. Does your father understand that? And, um, and by the way, look, <laughs> um, my, my Friday the 13th is the only, Friday thirteenth with that with as much male nudity as female nudity. Yeah, um, I was very egalitarian in that. I was very much about like I'm going to give the ladies something to look at. I'm not. I'm not going to make a sexist movie. I'm not doing it. Um, I was very against the idea of a sex equals death scene. New Line really wanted a scene where some campers got murdered because they had sex, 
and I put in the gag about the condom because I said, all right, I'll do an unsafe sex scene equals death. That I'll do. Okay. And when those kids choose not to use a condom, they get killed for it. Um, and I was like, that's something I'll say because I had a lot of friends in New York who had died of AIDS by that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was okay saying that. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was very conscientious in the way that I handled the nudity in the film. And I wanted people, I, again, I wanted my actors to feel respected and not treated like meat. Um, I know that that can be horrible for a, for a young actor or for any actor for that matter. Um, I even had, there's a great scene that got cut out of the film uh, with a wonderful actor named Jonathan Penner, who is now a, a terrific screenwriter um, who wrote The Bye Bye Man uh, last year. Mm -hmm. um, and Jonathan was one of, you know, was in the movie. He played Allison Smith's boyfriend, and he was completely nude in his scene. Um, and we were talking full frontal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so I was not, I was not about, you know, being sexist about it, but, you know, Carrie knew what she signed up for and manipulated us so that she didn't have to do it. And that's okay. That's her prerogative. And, and SAG allows for that. And I stand by anything SAG stands by. I'll stand by it. But instead of just being honest with us and just telling us, even after a few days of shooting, if she just talked to us, we could have resolved the situation pretty quickly. Instead, um, you know, she, uh, she obsessed about it. And she created an atmosphere for herself that was not as fun of an experience as it should have been. Mm -hmm. While the rest of the group was, you know, we were, we were at summer camp. We were having a great time. And I think Carrie robbed herself of that a little bit. And I think that's, um, that's a shame. That's a shame because I really like Carrie. And, and you know, uh, but before the film, I remember I got tickets for some of the cast to go see James Taylor. We all went out to Universal to see James Taylor live. And, you know, we did stuff as a group. And it was really fun. Like, we were having a really good time. I became friendly with her boyfriend at the time. We were buddies. Um, and, and I just feel like um, it's a shame when, uh, when young actors make young choices that end up haunting them to some degree. Um, and uh, it was a shame. She, you know, she didn't do the nudity. Uh, the scene is still in the film. It's when she goes, when she's showering, she's yep. crying about, about her mom. And I actually wanted that scene to be, I'm sure you've seen The Big Chill, the, the incredible, you know, Lawrence Kasdan movie. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the scene where Glenn Close is in the shower crying, that was the inspiration for the scene that I wanted to do in Jason Goes to Hell. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted it to be this very sensitive, you know, kind of sweet scene where there's this woman who is really, she, she is um, vulnerable truly vulnerable and has this moment of just breaking down. And um, I didn't want the scene, you know, here, here was the other problem. You know, I was, I made a movie where the lead, where the, you know, the, the final girl was a mother that had never been done before. That mm -hmm. was new. And the problem is when you cast someone as a mother, you sometimes rob them cinematically of their sexuality. Suddenly they go from available to being a mom. And what I was trying to do was let Carrie's character be as young as Carrie was. Like, say, yes, this is a mom, but she's a young mom, and she's still sexually viable, and she's still all of those things that people watch on screen and have their fantasy about. So I was actually just trying to make her look better and be, be more of the final girl of the movie. That's all I was trying to do. Um, but I wanted to do it in this kind of artistic way where here's this woman – who is at her most vulnerable, uh, completely alone, in the shower, crying about her mom and about her life and about this baby she has and what she's going to do. And then suddenly the lights go out. Mm -hmm. And now she is even more vulnerable. And that's what I was trying to do. Um, it's just such a shame that, you know, it became about boobies. Uh, it's, it's such a silly thing. It's so silly. Um, yeah. And I get it. You know, her dad was going to see the film. I got it. I, I, I understood it. I, and I tried to compensate for it. And she would not compromise with us. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a dark time. That was, that was a dark time. It really was. It was, it was a shame. Um, because we could have had so much more fun, her and I, on the movie. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it didn't end up being about that, which is too bad. Well, I know there was a lot of talk about she, uh, Sean Cunningham coming in on that and whatnot. Sean Cunningham, no, what happened was Sean Cunningham, after we had shot out all of Carrie's material, 
um, Carrie had done something, again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it. Carrie had done something on set that uh, was very controversial. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, uh, I immediately came to her side. Um, I dealt with it. I uh, got her off set immediately. Um, not in a bad way, in a good way. And uh, I received a phone call from her agent late that night with, uh, with Sean Cunningham on the line. And the agent um, was screaming at me uh, because we had figured out that Carrie was pulling a little bit of a number on our movie, um, financially, trying to do something. Okay. And I, um, and I nipped it in the bud. And <laughs> I saw it happening. I knew what was happening. And this guy didn't like that I saw it happening. And he demanded that there were a couple of uh, shots that were left. We had literally two shots left with Carrie. Um, and, uh, where, where, by the way, she had no dialogue. Two shots with no dialogue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, can even t- I can even show you the shots in the movie. There's two shots. And uh, I was told that I was not allowed to be on set with Carrie. So for those two shots, Sean Cunningham directed Carrie Keegan, um, which was fine, which was fine by me. And in fact... Uh, it actually worked out great for me because I was shoot. I had so much footage to shoot in my last couple of days that Sean just ran a second unit for an hour, got the shot we needed, and I was doing. I was shooting with all the other cast that I loved and that I worked well with. Okay. So, yeah, she she was separated from it, and I had no problem. I was like, okay, got it. I hear you. No problem. Um, but I mean, her agent. Uh, I, I have I have never professionally been called a cocksucker before. Oh. Um, I was. I was that day, um, and I was I was called Little Napoleon, and I was like, "Wow, I'm five ten. How am I Napoleon, dude?" Um, I mean, it was like it was just a lot of like very kind of crazy talk thrown at me, um, and uh, and what was kind of beautiful was that my cast, especially the other women in my cast, um, came to my defense uh, against what Carrie was trying to pull. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, it, it ended pretty quickly. It was uh, it was it. It started and ended almost in the same moment. Uh, but I, I said, great, Sean will direct you in the last couple shots. That's cool. Doesn't bother me. I'm good. You, um, I had other stuff to do. You mentioned there was a scene cut with uh, somebody involved with the Bye Bye Man who was... Uh, yeah, Jonathan Al- Penner. Allison Smith's boyfriend? Yep. Now, he was in a nude scene with Allison Smith that was cut? Al- Allison Smith was not nude. Allison Smith was in like this little skimpy slip. And her boyfriend comes home from work, and he's covered in grease. He's like a grease monkey. And uh, she goes off to, to go to work with the baby. She's got uh, Jessica's baby with her. She goes to go to work, and he starts to, and he takes off his clothes to take a shower. And Andy Block, another amazing actor, Andy Block shows up uh, and kills Jonathan Penner looking for the baby. He's, he's you know, it's Jason looking for for Stephanie's, uh, for, for the baby. Oh, I've, I've got to say, uh, uh, how nervous would somebody be getting, like, I can't experience it cause I'm not an actor, but how new, nervous he would be getting nude in front of, uh, Allison Smith. <laughs> he, he actually never had to get nude in front of Allison. I think he was shirtless in front of Allison, but then he took off all his clothes for the, for the, for the kill. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, and Jonathan, uh, Jonathan is awesome. Jo- Jonathan's one of my favorite guys. He's just, he is, he's, I was literally just emailing with him this morning. Um, Jonathan is funny and sardonic and he's just an amazing actor and a wonderful writer. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, you know, we had to, uh, we had to cut his, his scene from the film, uh, mostly for time. It was really just a time issue because his death is pretty gruesome. He, he gets his head slammed over and over again into the faucet of the sink and his teeth all get broken out. I mean, it's pretty hideous. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a, but, uh, but again, if I ever, you know, if I ever get a chance to, uh, to do, uh, there, there's a lot of fans who've been, who put a petition out for Warner brothers to allow me to, uh, to do my ultimate director's cut of the movie. I would reintroduce that footage. I would absolutely bring that stuff back in. So how, terrific footage. How much footage was cut? Uh, we cut over 35 minutes from the movie. Oh, wow. You could have a pretty long oh, yeah. movie over two hours. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The original cut of the film was a, a little over two, two hours and six minutes long. Um, and by the way, way too long. It was way too long. 
Um, I mean, I, I made, I, I, I made, uh, I made a movie that I really wanted you to fall in love with the characters and get to know them. And so I shot a lot of dialogue and, and, and character building scenes. And a lot of that stuff I would put back in, um, not all of it, but, but a lot of it I would, um, and look, you know, if I get to do if I get to do another cut of the movie, I would absolutely, you know, clean up some of the effects and 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 also add some digital effects in there to enhance certain things. Uh, not the not the gore or anything like that, but like one idea, one thing that I wanted to have happen in the movie was I wanted each person who became Jason as their bodies were deteriorating, as they were getting weaker and weaker, I wanted you to start to see the hockey mask under their skin starting to break through the skin oh so that yeah so that that hockey mask would keep kind of coming back um and so i i wanted that feeling there so that's something digitally that you can do now and it would cost nothing to do uh so that's you know that's that's something i would absolutely play with oh wow yeah yeah we just couldn't afford it at the time (laughs) Well, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the inspiration and and how you, like Stephen Williams played Creighton Duke. This was an interesting character. Now, now where did this idea come from? Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, Creighton Duke um, was uh, was really the inspiration of, I I lived, Dean Laurie, myself, and Noel Cunningham all lived together while we were writing the movie. And pretty much nightly, we would kind of joke about stuff to do in the film. And what I wanted in the movie was I wanted a Quint character. I wanted Quint from Jaws. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted, I wanted a guy who would, who was, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, the Ahab of the movie, someone who is, you know, trying to kill the shark. Um, and, uh, and so Dean was the first guy that he's the guy who actually came up with the name Creighton. Um, Duke was, uh, was a nod to escape from New York. Oh, okay. So the King of New York. Yeah, uh, Isaac so, Hayes. So, so it became Creighton Duke, um, and uh, and we we just fell in love with the idea of this character, and uh, and it was actually kind of it was an amazing thing because uh, if you remember the end of the the first sequence in the movie when uh, after Jason's blown up and you see Creighton Duke for the first time and you hear Creighton's theme that ba 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 happen mm-hmm. when you see when you see Creighton and then Creighton pulls the cigar from his mouth and goes, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Um, That line isn't in the script. Uh, I was standing on the hillside with Steven when we shot that and with Steven Williams when we shot that moment. And I, uh, I came up with that line on set and said, you got to say something like there has to be something about that moment that you have to have a narrative to. And I gave him the line. It was very funny because Dean Laurie came to me right afterwards. He was like, dude, that's the best line in the movie. I was like, awesome. <laughs> it's just, I just felt like it needed to be said. Um, so Creighton was one of the uh, – what's interesting about Creighton was originally um, the casting was very different than Steven. We had another actor who was going to do it. Um, uh, John Rubenstein was going to play that part. Okay. And uh, and uh, ultimately, we couldn't make the deal work, which was a shame because he did a beautiful job with the material. But uh, it actually ended up being kind of the best thing that could have happened for the movie because Stephen Williams, uh, beyond being one of the most inventive, interesting actors I've ever worked with, he is one of the best times I've ever had on set. Stephen Williams, like that, this man made my set a party every time he showed up. Okay, um, it was a joy. He's he's a remarkable talent. Um, and he really created, uh, I mean, like when we were shooting the prison scene, uh, the finger breaking scene, um, Steven, uh, Steven and I were kind of talking about how to, how to work the scene. And we were, we were kind of, you know, rehearsing it with each other and it evolved where it was like, okay, (laughs) these guys are in prison. Steven was like, well, what if it makes, what if I make it seem like I'm asking for sexual favors in order for the, you know, in, in exchange for the, uh, you know, for the information. I was like, okay, that's awesome. And that's why there's that, you know, longing shot on John LeMay puts his hand through the, through the bars and it gets swallowed by Steven's hands and Steven's caressing his hand gently. And John LeMay is looking at the guy like, what do you want me to do? And then Steven breaks his finger. <laughs> so it's, uh, 
we we were constantly letting Creighton evolve and become this kind of sadistic but brilliant Quint like bounty hunter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I will tell you, for my money, it's a, Creighton Duke is my favorite element of Jason Goes to Hell. It's 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 the part of Jason Goes to Hell that I take the most ownership over, that I love the most. Um, I have such a feeling for that character and for, for Steven's portrayal of it. Uh, I, I'm very proud of that, of that piece of, of drama. Do you ever stop and think about doing maybe a standalone movie with Creighton Duke? Um, I am actually, right now, my, my company, uh, 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 Skeleton Crew, is doing something that is inspired by Creighton Duke. We're doing it right now. Oh, wow. Um, I can't. I can't release any details about it, but we are, uh, you know, and Creighton Duke is uh, the, 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 the character is owned by, by whoever owns the movie now. So it keeps getting bounced around. Um, but uh, I, am, I am doing something that is inspired by the creation of Creighton Duke right now. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I have always loved the character and I've always wanted to give him more life. And uh, I think we found a way to do that. So we're doing that. There was something written, I don't know whether it was from Fangoria or whatnot, that, and i never seen this brought up in the movie, but okay. apparently uh, Creighton Duke became obsessed with hunting Jason since his fiance was killed in 1960. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, that's, that's the backstory. Um, it, he, uh, it's not really his fiance, it's his, it's his girl. It's, it's, it's a girl that he was madly in love with as a teenager, and they were out on Crystal Lake. Um, uh, in a rowboat um, and just having this romantic afternoon by themselves and it started to rain and it was like this kind of wonderful romantic thing and Jason capsized the boat and dragged Creighton Duke's girl under the surface never to be seen again and Creighton vowed revenge from that moment that's, that's when this young teenager decides to start hunting Jason but because Jason is as elusive as he is, and Jason, there's all of these rules to how you get him. Uh, Creighton Duke starts starts uh, bounty hunting other serial killers, and so in order to raise enough money to be able to research getting Jason, um, he goes after these other killers. So he just becomes this remarkable bounty hunter of serial killers, um, and yes, with with an obsessive eye towards Jason Voorhees his whole life. Wow. So Jason is his Moby Dick. And by the way, that monologue I would put back in the film because that (laughs) monologue does exist. So uh, this whole backstory, um, Mm -hmm. it's not in the film anywhere. Like, is it? Nope, it got cut. It got cut. Oh, it got cut. Yep. We shot it and it got cut. Oh, okay. Um, Look, here's the thing. Back, Back at that time, if you could deliver a movie that was just under 90 minutes, um, you would get an extra screening every day. So it, it equaled a lot more dollars for, the, for, for New Line. It just did. Um, so if you can get one more screening a day, <laughs> you just bumped your, your per screen average by 20%. Okay. So I had to keep cutting the drama out of the movie and just leave sort of the horror movie. Um, but for me... Uh, given the chance, I would put a lot of that stuff back into the film and let the fans really see what we intended um, from the beginning. Yeah, here's here's uh, another thing too. Like, um, mm-hmm. if that happened in 1960, it would have been three years after he drowned. Didn't he not start killing until after Mrs. Voorhees is beheaded? Um, not to our estimation. And again, remember, you know. It, it, If this creature, (laughs) Mm -hmm. to be honest, if this creature who lives under the surface of this lake, um, if this boy were to grow up, this boy would be a teenager by that time. Mm -hmm. And a teenager has all kinds of hormones going on. And here's this pretty young girl up in that boat, and he wants her. And he takes her. So that was the idea. It's interesting you bring that up. Because... I heard some dialogue about Friday the 13th, the final chapter, where after, um, it, when Jason is is uh, between Corey Feldman and Kimberly Beck, and he's got the uh, the mask knocked off him, 
and she's backing up away from him, and the machete hits the floor. You see him kind of, and I guess this was said, that he was reaching out, and his hand was almost touching her her uh, breasts. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never thought anything out of, of that until you just mentioned that, that, uh, mm-hmm. that yeah, that, I, 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 you know, and of course... Um, it's like somebody had stated that Jason suddenly found something other than killing them. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, you got all these gorgeous women. Like, uh, he- well, but it's, it's, it, look, but let's be honest, that the whole series is born out of this idea of lust uh, being a punishable offense. Mm-hmm. Um, and Pamela Voorhees murders because of lust. She murders because these campers, I mean, these counselors were having sex rather than watching her son. So sex is a big part of what this movie's about and about what all these movies are about and repression. I mean, if anybody has sex in a Friday 13th movie, they're going to die. Anybody smokes weed in a Friday 13th movie, they're going to die. Anybody drinks alcohol underage, they're going to die. So it, it is the, this sort of weirdly puritanical sinful thing that Mrs. Voorhees kills for. And then Jason kills for, um, and the problem is, look, again, I just think that Jason kept getting more and more reduced to a shark in the lake. Mm-hmm. And for me, yeah, Jaws, the best thing, single best directed horror film of all time is Steven Spielberg's Jaws. Okay. It's a mass, it's, you can't get better. Mm-hmm. You just can't. Sorry. You know, and, and, I'm, and I'm including all classics. Um, but guess what? Jaws 2? Eh. Okay. <laughs> Agreed. Jaws Jaws three, oi. Yep. Four, <laughs> Agreed. Stop. Okay. Here's the thing. Mm, when do we start saying that about Jason? Like, okay, now it's just a shark in this. Now it's a shark in Manhattan. Now it's a shark here. Now, I mean, uh huh. It's a shark. Here's the thing, and why Jason goes to hell is the movie it is. I, I didn't want to make a movie about a shark. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wanted to make a movie about Jason Voorhees. I wanted to make a movie about a complicated set of morality. And that's what the first film is about. And that's what the second film is about. And as we get in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, it diminishes the point. Again, I think six resurrects the point in a fascinating way because six becomes a monster movie of a different type. It's almost, in some ways, it's Frankensteinian. It's a little George Romero. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, got, it's got something on its mind. Yeah. But, but by part seven, they're literally going, okay, we still got a shark. I know the shark will fight Carrie White. Yep. You know, I mean, yep. it, it really started to become that franchise. And then it was like, all right, let's put the shark in Manhattan. Well, we can't afford Manhattan, so he'll be on a boat and then he'll get to Montreal. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just um, by the time we got to part nine, my part, I, I just went, can we, can we have some mythology? Can we talk about Jason Voorhees? Instead of just having a bunch of, you know, campers to knock down with this bowling ball. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's where the inspiration came from. I don't want to get off topic, but could, I want to know if you explain a little bit. And I had this conversation with Adrian King. I, I love the opening of part two. But even she wonders how in the frig Jason found her. <laughs> and, and even Adrian does, uh, I had to point out to her, you see Alice's body back in that shack at, you know, right. you could see it in the, the shack where the severed head is. Yep. Yeah, I don't think she caught that, but. Uh, no, it's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, first off, who, who drove Jason over? <laughs> um, did Jason drive himself over? And by the way, before there was a Google, how did Jason, this hydrocephalic headed, um, you know, backwoods kid who's been living at the bottom of a lake for 30 years, um, how did he find her address? Yeah. Did he look in the, did he look in the yellow pages? Because I got a feeling he couldn't read. Yeah. Don't think that happened. But again, by the way, this is why. I connected the evil dead to these movies. This is a hundred percent why, because for me, the idea that Pamela Voorhees would do anything to resurrect her Jason and even making a deal with the devil, even making her son into a deadite. But that makes Jason have a conscience 
that gives Jason Jason a sense sentience that allows him to do things like that. And for me, it explains away a lot of the problems in the movie. Okay. And that's why that's there. Because I'm the first one to say, okay, who, who taught Michael Myers how to drive a car? Yeah. Who taught him? Dr. Loomis? Well, Why do we treat- at least, you know, it's addressed. Even uh, Donald Pleasant's go, you know, uh, when the guy goes, for, for goodness sakes, he can't drive a car. And he goes, well, he was doing very well last night, you know. So, right. so at least right. Carpenter addressed it. He didn't exactly go into well, detail. He, but he addresses it, and he addresses it with humor, which is Carpenter's genius. Yeah. Carpenter finds a way to make you laugh so you forget about it. But here's the problem. With Friday 13th, first off, um, how about the fact that the events of Friday 13th Part 1 and Part 2 only take place a couple of months apart? Yeah. And somehow I saw a 13-year-old Ari Lehman jump out of the lake at the end of Part 1, and I saw an adult man kill Alice and kill everybody else in Part 2. So how did that happen? Well, Part 2, the rest of Part 2 takes place five years later. The what? The rest of Part 2 takes place five years later. The rest, wait a minute, the rest of it, but Alice gets killed soon after the events of the first movie. Yeah. And... And by the way, that was a little boy. The guy who stabs her in the head is not a little boy. Yeah. And by the way, if it's a little boy, there's more questions about how did the little boy get to her house? <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Adrian's still trying to figure out who, <laughs> what was wrong with the wardrobe person. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because, again, look, by the way, the opening of that film is, is tremendous. It's scary and yep. upsetting and terrific. So from an entertainment standpoint, awesome. awesome yeah. Terrific stuff. Well, I had a little when a stranger calls going for it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, one more thing about Jason Goes to Hell. Of course, Dean no. Laurie has a little part in it and... Uh, and you, of course, uh, you get thrown over a desk, and and you get uh, you know punched out by Creighton Duke. Yep. What made you yep. want to do that part? Um, honestly, I, I've been in almost every film that I've directed. I ha- I've had a part in. Um, I started as an actor. That was where that was the beginning of my career was as an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I love jumping into something just to have fun and and you know play on on screen. Um, uh, the reason for the part in Jason Goes to Hell was that I knew it would only be a couple days that I would have to be in uniform and have to play the part. Um, and quite frankly, uh, I didn't want to take my, ball, my eye off the ball of directing. So um, it allowed me to have some fun and work with some people that I was really crazy about and jump in front of the screen and have, you know, have, just have a good time. Um, but uh, I also, look, I was excited. I got to do my own stunts. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a couple stunts in the movie, which were fun, uh, and I've always, you know, been able to do that stuff. And um, yeah, it was just it was a good time for me, you know, playing Officer Bish. Which, and I mean, Sean, uh, Sean had great fun with me being Officer Bish. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, there was a lot of joking around. But even when when uh, when they ended up calling uh, Julie's character Agent Marcus, that they didn't even tell me they were going to do that. No. Um, they they told uh, Jimmy Gleason to uh, to call her that um, in that scene without telling me. Uh, <laughs> and when when we cut, I turned to Jimmy and Jimmy was like, ah, and Sean thought that was hilarious. So, um, so there was a certain party atmosphere to all of this uh, that that worked. That kept everybody in a really good place. So no, that's why I did it. But I will tell you, I mean, I'm shooting a film later this year called The Harvest, uh, which is a thriller. And um, I'm actually I'm directing the film. Uh, my wife and I wrote it, but I'm playing one of the lead characters in the movie. Um, so uh, it's it's kind of a uh, Billy Bob Thornton Sling Blade ish character, uh, kind of of mice and men kind of guy. Um, and so I'm playing that later this year. So I, I do act on occasion when I when I'm interested in a part when I think it's going to be fun. Okay. Well, you know what. Um... Your your movie get, then goes to Jason X, which my oh. opinion was the weakest one of the franchise. Uh-huh. <laughs> I call it a lot of people feel that way. I call it the room of the Friday franchise. 
I remember seeing Jason X in theaters and people laughed at it. I was like, suddenly it's not a horror film anymore. Um, but it went from Jason, of course, I guess Sean Cunningham said they need to get something out in between Jason Goes to Hell and, and uh, Freddy versus Jason. Do you have any thoughts on Jason X? Um, look, uh, a lot of my friends worked on Jason X. Todd Farmer is a terrific guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Noel Cunningham, you know, was, was the producer of the movie. Um, uh, here's my <laughs> thought on Jason X. <laughs> Jason X had to be made or people were going to lose the rights to the franchise. That's absolutely true. That's why it got made. Um, I think that uh, the David Cronenberg stuff in the beginning is awesome because of David Cronenberg. And yep. I'm a huge fan, so mm -hmm. that's awesome and fun. I think there are some great ideas in that movie. I think there's some really cool sequences in the film. I think the frozen head kill is one of the best kills of the franchise. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I feel as though um, Jason X exists because no one could get their heads out of their behinds on Freddy vs. Jason. Okay. And I have to tell you, for it to have taken 10 years to get to Freddy vs. Jason, and especially the movie they ended up making, um, is so frustrating. It's so silly. Um, and so much more about egos than it's about filmmaking. Uh, I, 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 feel, I, I actually feel for everybody involved with, with Freddy vs. Jason. Um, I do. Uh, because I think that they had incredible concepts, great ideas, they didn't have enough money to, I think, pull off what they wanted to pull off. I think they pulled off certain things really, really well. Um, but, you know, and by the way, they had Kane Hodder as Jason and doing some great work. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Sean Cunningham made a comment to me when I was making Jason Goes to Hell, and I, and I have taken this to heart my whole career. He said, Adam, your competition is not the other Friday 13th movies. That's not your competition. When you go to a movie theater, your competition is Terminator 2. Okay. Because it costs the same amount of money for a moviegoer to go see Terminator 2 than it is to pay to see your film. So what are you going to give an audience in Jason Goes to Hell that they can't get in Terminator 2? And i got to tell you, that was an incredibly powerful, important piece of, of, of uh, advice about filmmaking from Sean. Yeah. Um, and very much a pro what, where his producerial genius comes into play. The problem, I think, with Jason Goes to Hell is that they wanted to make Alien or Aliens, but they didn't have the budget to make Aliens. So they made this sort of hybrid movie um, that was not supported by what they needed to make that movie spectacular. Um, the other problem, look, I said it earlier. You know, we put the shark up against Kerry White. We put the shark on a boat to Manhattan. We put the shark in space. <laughs> and that, I think, is, um, look, you know, they put a lot of monsters and uh, leprechauns into space. Yeah. You know, they, they, they do this when they're running out of ideas. Yep. And honestly, it's, the problem is, is that they're always, everybody's always chasing this idea of what's the bigger and better instead of saying, wait a minute, we don't have to go bigger. We can actually go smaller. We can actually make this about characters. Um, where Jason Goes to Hell, I think, has its greatest strength is in the character work, in the acting. Yeah. Those people are real people. They're not silly teenagers. They're not kids running around smoking weed and showing off their boobies. That's not what the movie is. The movie has as many middle-aged characters as it has young, you know, late teens, early 20-somethings. Um, it's about people and their lives. And the truth is, if you can get an audience to care about the characters and then put the shark in the water, the reason Jaws is great is that they couldn't get the damn shark to work. You don't see the shark. The yeah. shark's not in the movie. It's that you love Roy Scheider. You think Chief Brody is the coolest guy ever, and you care about his children, and you care about his wife, and you love Matt Hooper, and you love Quint. Mm -hmm. And the more you love those guys, the more terrified you are of that shark. And the problem with most slasher movies, not all, but most, is that they don't allow you the time to love the people they're going to murder. 
That's right. And if you don't love them, how do you? Why? Why would you care? Because the kills are cool. Kills being cool is easy. But making people love care. Look, you know, we we talked about earlier when Allison Smith picks up that shotgun, and instead of running away like most young women in those movies do, like most of the women in Friday Thirteenth franchise do. She picks up a gun, cocks it, and shoots Jason, point blank. Mm -hmm. She doesn't run away. And by the way, he keeps coming, and then she grabs that huge barbecue skewer, an industrial skewer, and she runs him through with it. By the way, I love the fact you shot that part in slow motion. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. you. Um, No, I I wanted, uh, look, I wanted my women, I wanted all the women in the movie to be warriors, to be badass. I didn't want them to be, you know, girls who just got naked. Uh, okay. I mean, by the way, I love nudity. I'm, I have lots of nudity in the film. I'm all for it. And I love all nudity. I, it doesn't have to just be women running around. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's awesome because what it does is it strips down a character so they're vulnerable. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but for me, you know, I wanted people you love. I wanted people you were sorry to see them go. When Aaron Gray dies in the movie, um, you're, you're heartbroken. Yes, he, yep. The, the audience on that, and by the way, I just got to see this movie with an audience two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, uh, my film Secret Santa was in a, uh, was in a festival in, in Chicago, a fantastic festival called uh, Windy City Hararama. Mm-hmm. And they showed Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa back to back. Okay. And so I just I just watched Jason Goes to Hell on a big screen. It was fantastic, and it was the uncut version. It was terrific. Oh wow! But, um, the uh, the moment when you know when uh, uh, Jason uh, as Josh throws the um, the knife sharpener across the room and it goes through Aaron Gray's back. The audience on mass had this gasp, just a gasp, and there was someone in the audience who went, "Oh no." Yeah, and I went. That's that's what I'm trying to do. There that's you go. What I'm trying to do is make the audience love these people, and that's the problem with with things like Jason X. It's like, who do you love? Mm-hmm. Who do you love? You know, they're all very pretty. They all look great. They're all you know, and they're talented. But but do you love them? You're not given enough time to love them. Exactly. Exactly. You know? No, that's why, um, ba- why I put a baby in the movie. You know, that baby, the minute you see a baby, come on, every time that kid, we cut to a shot of that baby, um, who, by the way, is the sweetest young woman in the world now, <laughs> the girl who played the baby, who's grown up, <laughs> crazy. Um, but the, the, the minute you cut to that baby, the whole audience, oh, oh, that's it. <laughs> I got him. I got you. I can put a baby in the movie. <laughs> you have to love the baby. Everybody loves the baby. Yeah, you had your uh, your wife uh, Deborah Sullivan in a couple of movies. Uh, she's not yes. in Jason Goes to Hell, is she? No, we met. We met after I shot the film. Um, oh, okay. And so we met while I was posting the movie. And Deborah is the is does a lot of the vocal work of a lot of the women in the movie. Okay. Yeah. So Deb is most of the screams in the film are Deb. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the running and panting is Deb. Um, so no, Deborah is in Jason Goes to Hell, but only in an auditory sense. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's no, talk. Deb, Deborah is an amazing actress. She's she's uh, she's one of the best actors I've ever known. She's astonishing. Well, it's awesome you two have been married so long. You don't hear that yeah. in uh, the business much anymore. You do not. You do not. And she's uh, she's 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 my partner. She's my wife. But most importantly, she's my best friend. She's the person who makes me laugh the most. Oh, that's fantastic! Um, and that's that's the trick. That's the trick. You got to keep each other laughing, otherwise, none of it works. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jason Goes to Hell was released in the summer of 1993, which was dominated by movies like Jurassic Park and uh, The yep. Fugitive. So you had quite a bit of competition there. Oh yeah. Well, what, uh, we came out the week after The Fugitive. Wow. So we knew we were never going to get number one. We knew that the fugitive was a juggernaut. It was never going to. We were never going to take that spot from it. But it kind of worked out great because the the front cover of Variety, and I have this in my office framed, the front cover of Variety. The headline was uh, box office number one goes to fugitive. Rest of box office goes to hell. <laughs> 
And I'm sorry, that's that's uh, you can put that on my on my tombstone. I'm cool. <laughs> uh, so uh, no, I was I was uh, the movie was very successful uh, in its initial run. And, um, you know, look, you know, n- nothing made the money that stuff now make, you know, the, the, the way movies come out now and they're out for two weeks and they make, you know, sixty five million dollars. The, the box office just wasn't that back then. No. Um, but uh, the, the great thing was New Line had uh, uh, speaking of the tenth scene. They got me to shoot footage that they told me up front. We're, this is going to get cut. The MPAA is never going to let you have this footage. And I was like, well, then why am I shooting it? They said, well, because we have a plan. And Jason Goes to Hell was the first video ever released simultaneously in a cut and uncut version. Mm -hmm. So every mom and pop shop didn't buy one copy. They had to buy two copies. Um, It was the most successful VHS uh, video recording that New Line had ever put out was because everybody had to buy two copies. How would you have done Freddy versus Jason had it been up to you? Hmm. Uh, well, the pitch that we went in with, uh, Dean Laurie and I had, had been working on a pitch for a while um, prior to, the, to, to them uh, starting up, you know, trying to make that movie. The pitch was um, that uh, the opening of the film happens in Freddy's theme room. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's chasing a teenager. And just as he's about to make the kill, suddenly uh, Freddy gets punched in the face. And when he stumbles back, it's Jason in front of him. And the two of them just start beating the shit out of each other, right? And they're cutting each other up and slice, 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 slice. And suddenly the boiler room floor breaks apart underneath their, their feet and the two sections of floor are pulled apart. And you realize they are not in a boiler room. They are in um, hell. Okay. And they are li- reliving this fight over and over and over again in hell. And what we find out is that these two creatures, these two beings, are hell's assassins. But because <laughs> they are the two big guys on the block, there's not enough room on Earth for both of them. So only one can be up there. And the devil sends both of them back up and there is a prize and the prize is uh tommy jarvis and nancy from nightmare on elm street okay and whoever can get those two kills gets to stay on earth as hell's assassin and the other one goes to hell forever okay and uh and Dean and I were resurrecting Creighton Duke, that Creighton Duke had not, in fact, died at the end of Jason Goes to Hell, that his ribs were broken, and that he was uh, partially paralyzed. Um, but, uh, but Stephen Williams and Heather Langenkamp and, uh, and Tom Matthews would be on the run across America with Freddie and Jason coming for them. And oh, wow. the fun is that every time one of them would get close to a kill, the other would stop them from making the kill. So it became this battle royale. But again, much like what I tried to do with Jason Goes to Hell, I wanted the heroes to be as important as the villains. Mm-hmm. And so that was the movie. It was very simple. It was very direct. <laughs> get these people. Whoever, whoever gets them wins and gets to stay. And uh, it was really a fight between these two guys to, to win this prize, to be Hell's Assassin. And why did that not come through? Uh, because, again, there were 58 cooks in the kitchen. Uh. That's why. And um, I, I find it amazing. In, in Freddy vs. Jason, there's that scene where all the kids are around the table while Jason is taking a nap on a sofa. Um, literally taking a nap on a sofa. And uh, the kids actually have this meeting about how do we kill Freddy and Jason? Like, how do we do it? And I sat there going, oh, my God, this is a story session. Someone recorded the the, the story session at New Line. (laughs) It was literally a room. I I recognize the I recognize the room. I recognize what they were doing. And I was like, this is literally a bunch of writers and executives sitting around a table trying to figure out their plot. And they recorded it and put it in the movie. <laughs> so it's what the scene is. I, I, I recognize that moment. 
Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know why it wasn't Freddy versus Jason. I think it would have been a more fun movie. Um, and again, you know, much like, you know, like when you go to see the Marvel movies, um, mm-hmm. the reason the Marvel movies are so good and so fun is because the villains are so good and so fun. Yeah. And my problem is the reverse on, on slasher movies and on, on the big kind of, you know, the icons of slasher. Um, I think the, vi- I think the movies are only as good as the heroes are to the villains because the villains are really the heroes. They're the anti-heroes for the audience. That's who people are coming to see. You're paying to see Jason or paying to see Freddy. But for my money, those villains are only interesting if our heroes are just as interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was what we wanted to do with Freddy versus Jason. Let's talk about Secret Santa, your new project now. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um <laughs> I haven't heard much about this, so I, I, I really love movies like, like Black Christmas and, mm-hmm. and movies mm-hmm. like that. And um, so uh, is this getting into that kind of a spirit? Um, it, well, it, it's a little more like Black Christmas than, let's say, um, Silent Night, Deadly Night, which this movie is nothing like. Um, okay. Here's the thing about Secret Santa. Secret Santa is not about a killer Santa at all. Okay. Secret Santa, um, first off, it's my return to directing horror. Um, I've written a lot of horror. My, my wife and I wrote Texas Chainsaw a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've always had my foot you know, in, that, in that pool, but I've been also doing comedies. I've been doing action films. I've, I've directed a number of things that are, um, that are off genre. Um, this is my return to genre uh, where I plan to stay for quite a bit. Um, and and I got to tell you, uh, it's the movie I am most proud of. Um, Secret Santa is about um, a family, uh, the Popes, um, who run a pharmaceutical company, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest in the country. And they've got this beautiful lake house up in Big Bear, California, where they go for Christmas Eve dinner and the family party every year. And this year, someone in the family and everybody in the family sort of works for the company in some way. But someone in the family has decided to spike the punch with a military grade truth serum that has been tested but not approved. Okay. And the problem with this is that first everybody starts telling their truth. Everybody starts saying what they think about each other. Okay. But pretty soon everybody starts doing what they want to do to each other. Oh wow. And the fun of the movie is that it is it is a it's a horror film and it's a comedy it's a it's a haramity, um, and it is uh, we j- literally just won best picture at a festival uh, last Monday night so a, w- a week ago we won we won best picture um, at uh, in an LA festival uh, and we won it for best comedy. Okay. Um, because the movie is it is side splittingly funny. It is the most un PC movie. Um, I tell people before any screening, I tell them, please be prepared to be horribly offended. Everyone in this room will be offended. And quite frankly, if you're not offended, I didn't do my job. Okay. Um, it is it is a, it is about the, the things we really feel about our family members. It's about this forced uh, familial warmness that we're supposed to have at Christmas. But the truth is, everybody's either got the drunk uncle or the demeaning mother or the taskmaster father or the bitter rival child sister or brother um everybody's got secrets that they keep from their family and the fun of secret santa is that it's about when your secrets come out and the truth doesn't hurt it kills oh yeah that's uh, the movie (laughs) i hope it gets a wide release because i love the premise already Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um, we, we, we are, uh, we're actually in negotiations right now for our release, so it's actually going very, very well. It's a tiny little movie, and it has been killing it at festivals. Like we're, every review we've gotten has been amazing. Um, we're very blessed. I mean, audiences love this movie. We, we have people literally giving us standing ovations for the film. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the premise behind why we made the movie, I, I started a company with my wife and my, my partner, uh, Brian Sexton, who is the single best producer I've ever, I've ever worked with. Um, the three of us formed this company two and a half years ago. 
And part of the reason we did it was that I, I was so tired of, you know, we've written for the studios a lot. And by the way, we've been very blessed. And thank God they, they paid us and gave us a lovely life. And it's been, you know, I feel very, very lucky. But you go to see a movie that you wrote, and it's not the movie you wrote. And then you get a bad review for things you didn't write. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, I didn't write that. That's not, I didn't do that. That Somebody else did that. Kind of like what um, you got with the, the references to The Hidden, which uh, you said that you did not see. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't see it until after I wrote the movie. Yeah. Um, and by the way, people who say it's like The Hidden, I'm like, you know what? It's a lot like The Hidden. You're absolutely right. I have no problem saying you're right. It's just I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing. I... Um, you know, I, 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 I don't mind being dinged on stuff that I've done. I'll take the, you know, anybody has a problem with Jason goes to hell. Most of the time I go, yep, you got it. It's on me. And if you didn't like that, I take, I take the full credit for it. Got it. But, you know, when we made Texas Chainsaw, that's not the movie we wrote. And, you know, we wrote a movie where the timeline made perfect sense, mm-hmm. where characters acted in a way that made sense. We had way more kills. We also wrote a movie that was supposed to be $20 million, and they made it for $8 million. Well, you can't do the same effects. You can't have the same crowd scenes. You can't have a stampede of cattle with <coughs> leather-faced water <coughs> for the cattle. Let's go. Yeah. All right, brother. Cool. You okay? Yep, I'm all right. Just had a frog in my throat. <laughs> totally. understand. Um, Did you do the you Texas Chainsaw? That was with Jessica Biel, right? No, 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 no. That's that's the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We did Texas Chainsaw with uh, Alexandra Daddario. Oh, she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous, and she's the she is a lovely woman and a wonderful actor. She's a terrific lady. I gotta uh, say, I love the scene where she's like chained up there, yeah. and that chainsaw is just inches away from her. And if it oh, wasn't yeah. for that little symbol, <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, like we did not write "Do Your Thing" because. Like, we didn't write that line. Um, okay. And we get dinged for it all the time. So what happened was uh, I said, I am tired of, of doing all this work that I'm really proud of and then having somebody else change it for no good goddamn reason. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to make a movie, I want, I want the, the ding to be on me. If, if I do something wrong and somebody doesn't like it, I'll take full responsibility. But I want it to be what I made. Yep. And um, and the other thing is there is such tremendous waste on these movies, the amount of money that is wasted on films um, where it's not going into any good workman's pocket where it's just being pissed away. And um, I find that kind of waste disgusting. I, I find uh, I find it is actually the, the, the enemy of artistry. Um, I think that, you know, great filmmakers figure out how to fix a problem on paper, which costs nothing. Yeah, they don't pour buckets of money on it to fix the problem. And so for me, you know, we're doing these, you know, we did Secret Santa down and dirty, very, very low budget. Um, And I've been teaching acting for the last 23 years in Los Angeles. Um, And in fact, I was teaching acting when I was in New York back when I was a kid. I, I started teaching when I was 15 years old. And I love working with actors and I love teaching. I have got, you know, 60 plus actors in my troupe that are remarkable performers. I mean, just incredible actors. And these folks, um, you know, if they get five lines on CSI, they're like thrilled. If they get to be the dead body on NCIS, they're psyched. And they get paid very well, and that's terrific, and they get another credit on television, all good. But these people have trained their whole lives to do real work, to do to play leads in projects. And for me, horror used to be this wonderful genre that broke careers, that gave people their careers. Now we're constantly seeing movie stars in horror movies. Yeah. And, and I'm going, again, nobody went to see Jaws because Roy Scheider was in it. No. They went to see Jaws because of the shark. Yeah. Horror movies are the one genre that the, the, it's, the, it's the monster that tells the movie, not the cast. Mm-hmm. And somehow we've forgotten that. And for me, um, you know, Secret Santa is the first step into doing something that is um, that is really more about sort of the Roger Corman school of filmmaking. Make it for what you need, not for what you can get, but for what you need. And um, and make a movie that allows new talent to shine 
and break through into the marketplace. So that's kind of the that's kind of the philosophy of Skeleton Crew. We are also making a couple of bigger budget movies. We have a television thing we're doing. So we you know we we, we service all areas of, of the industry. But the, the the part of Skeleton Crew that is my favorite part and why the name of the company is Skeleton Crew is um is this lean mean go get it make it and do it with people that you love working with and that you want to make them a part of the industry um we have you know we have um in our mission statement we have writers about the fact that every film that we make a key person in the film a key a key position has to be filled by somebody over 60 um that uh the that there needs to be equal number of roles for men and for women, mm-hmm. there needs to be equal number of roles for people of color. Um, that we are really putting our money where our mouth is, in that we are making films that are diverse, that are uh, diverse not just in, in gender but in in in, uh, in race. We are doing films that are about, um, you know, we've got a, the, one of the movies we're working on right now that we're, we're making is a movie called Fat Camp Massacre. Okay. And it is, you know, it's a horror film. Um, it's definitely got its tongue in its cheek, and it's funny. But it is about uh, a culture of bullying about people of size. Okay. And we are really doing a rally cry against body dysmorphia. Um, and, uh, but doing it in sort of a Friday the 13th setting. Mm-hmm. And for me, the, this is, look, the greatness of George Romero was that Night of the Living Dead was not about zombies. It was about class warfare. It was about the Vietnam War. Um, the best horror movies are not about the horror. They're actually about something much more interesting that the movie is an allegory for. And I think we've lost some of that. I think we need to go back to actually saying something in horror um, and keeping our part of the industry as fresh and as exciting as it should be. Because we, we are filmmakers that want to say things. And Secret Santa is, trust me, it is about class warfare in a big way. Um, it is about the things we wish we could say to our families and never have the guts to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also about, you know, um, this, the, again, this forced idea that your family is your family um, only because you were born into it, rather than the people that you choose being your family. So mm-hmm. it's... Um, we got a we got a review this morning that was so I'm I'm still buzzing from it. It still makes me so happy, where a critic recognized um, sort of what we were doing as far as you know sexual identity in the movie and 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 race, and uh, and it made me so proud because I was like, it was someone who just got what we what we were up to, and that's exciting for me as a filmmaker because I go you know what, films have to open up conversation, mm-hmm. and uh, nobody leaves this movie without talking about it they want to talk about it and that's exciting for me because the horror movie it's a horror film yep and they're not talking about the gore <laughs> there's one one critic said uh <coughs> secret santa gets a lot less violent once these people shut up and start stabbing each other <laughs> and i was like that's it you're right on the money and by the way it is a bloody movie oh is it bloody Mm-hmm. And again, Bob Kurtzman, Bob Kurtzman came out and, uh, you know, and did all the effects on the movie. But I also have to tell you, Bob Kurtzman, not only did he do the effects, Bob uh, uh, ran second camera. Bob shot the movie with us. Um, and it was awesome to see this amazing makeup artist and director, because Bob has directed films before, but to see him holding a camera and to see him getting the shot. And so, like, and again, like a kid in a sandbox. And for me, I want Skeleton Crew to be the biggest sandbox it can be and allow all of these new, exciting artists to get a chance to play. Absolutely. And, of course, your wife is in the film. She sure is. Oh, my God, dude. She's Oh, she's so good. She's, she actually, uh, a critic, the same critic this morning who just gave us this wonderful review, uh, the critic said that Tennessee Williams would have been giddy to uh to work with my wife uh had he been alive to see this performance <laughs> like uh, my wife literally looked at me and said i can die now I, I, that's all i needed that's all i needed here <laughs> so, what's it like uh, to direct your wife 
Um, it's, it's actually amazing because here's the thing, because we write together, Mm -hmm. um, we've created certain ground rules over the years about how to, how to speak to each other in a creative way and how to, how to be able to give a note without, (laughs) without making the person feel bad. Um, so we have a really quick dialogue with each other. We're, um, by the way, my wife has been a student of mine as an actress for 23 years. Okay. So we've been, you know, I direct her twice a week, every week. Um, so we we have a relationship that is so shorthanded now that um, and that's the great thing about all my actors is that we all speak the same language um, so that I can shoot things. I shot Secret Santa in 11 nights. OK. 11 days to shoot the whole movie. And um, there are 13 main characters in the film. So there are 13 people on screen. Most of the movie um, to shoot coverage for 13 actors uh, is, uh, is crazy. And to do it in 11 days is unheard of. And the only way I can do that is because I know my actors so well, and I'm able to communicate in such a quick way with them that they get it, they move on, they get it done. And, uh, that is very freeing as a director. It really is. It's, it's an exciting process. Wow. So, um, yeah, to get to get all the all that simultaneously done, it's almost like a Gosford Park uh, kind of feel. You yeah. got all these people yeah. on screen at once. Yep, absolutely. Um, someone ha- uh, someone just referred to it. Uh, let's see, uh, one person called it. Um, if Louis Bunuel directed the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie while on acid. Okay. One. That was one person's estimation. Another person said uh, it's August Osage County with knives. Okay. <laughs> and I was kind of like, yeah, that's about right. That's that's pretty much what it is. Uh, it is. Uh, it's brutal. It's funny. Uh, it's gross. Okay. It is. Um, it's a movie you won't soon forget. And that's that's what I'm. That's that's what I love about. It. And I'm telling you, my wife is. Uh, uh, she's over the top, fantastic in it. Well, we get a lot of horror movies over the years, you know, and and mm-hmm. you know, I like The Conjuring. I liked, um, sure. Oh, uh, what was it? Um, Don't breathe. I didn't mind that. Sure. And sure. You, you get a few of them out there that are really good, but there's an awful lot of them that are really, really bad as well. You know, yep. Um, yep. Like the latest Blair Witch was really bad, but mm-hmm. you know, and but you get a lot of bad ones out there, but. Sure. Um, what I'm finding is that um, when you get something that's, that really knocks it out of the park, like I'm hoping your movie gets a wide release, not one of these limited releases or right. direct-to-video. I'd like to see it get a wide release. You sound to me like you have an idea. Um, we're Yeah, we're, we're uh, again, I can't say what. I can't say with who, but we're in a good place right now. So we'll see. We'll see. I, 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 I can't guarantee how it's going to go. Um, what I can tell you is that it will, the movie will be available uh, nationwide and worldwide by the end of the year. It's interesting because Jason Goes to Hell was the only Friday the 13th movie not released in my hometown. Really? <laughs> yeah, we didn't get it at our theater for some strange, strange reason. Right, so, well, I know, I, I know there was controversy, one, because we used Hell in the title. I also know that uh, the poster got banned uh, in a lot of places, um, which, by the way, they were the, the new line was thrilled that the poster got banned because we got the front front page of USA Today. Why did uh, it get banned? Uh, well, because let's be honest, the poster is a giant snake like penis coming through a hockey mask. So um, it's a pretty gross poster. And, it you know, it freaked people out. OK, I mean, that's literally what happened. And they would put a big black banner across the snake creature um even in certain towns that banner would just be there so you couldn't see the whole poster which by the way is great mark i mean from a from a william castle perspective it's the best marketing you can have you know this poster is too scary for you to look at okay great (laughs) like i'm gonna go see that movie that's the movie i want to (laughs) see so uh but no it's interesting because the movie was i think it opened on 1800 screens and it was a big big release Mm-hmm. Um, and it's why we were able to make the money we made on opening weekend. Yep. You've yeah. done a few other movies, too, I want to touch upon. You worked mm-hmm. with Bernadette Peters in Let It Snow. Right. I haven't seen this, but I loved her in The Jerk in various movies. What would she like to work with? 
Uh, a dream come true. Mm -hmm. um, Bernadette, uh, my brother Kip and I, uh, Kip wrote the film, I directed it, and, and uh, Kip was, uh, was the star of the movie. He, Kip, Kip had been on Broadway. He was also, uh, if you ever saw the new Leave it to Beaver, Kip played uh, the Beaver's son, Kip Cleaver, for five years on the Disney Channel. Okay. Um, and, uh, but he was Marius on Broadway in Les Mis, and you know, he had, had kind of a wonderful career. And uh, my brother and I, since The Jerk, had fallen in love with Bernadette Peters when we were little kids. I mean, mm -hmm. We truly fell in love with her. And when we wrote the part um, in the movie, she was the only person that we wanted to have play the part. And Bernadette was so impressed by the script and by my brother and I uh, that she, um, she had taken a nine-year hiatus from film. She had not been in the film in nine years. She did not like filmmaking. She didn't like working with the director she'd worked with. She really just didn't like it. Um, she loved being on Broadway. And uh, she broke that to work on our film. Oh, wow. And she, 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 uh, she had an amazing time with us. We had an amazing time with her. Um, uh, she is truly uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the angels, truly an angel. Um, she's, uh, <laughs> she's an extraordinary person. Um, I, I, I adore Bernadette. I would do anything for Bernadette. Um, so, yeah, no, no, no. We, we, we got along quite famously, actually. So I, I love Bernie. And you did uh, another film that had your wife in it, Conspiracy. You got to work with yeah. Val Kilmer and uh, Bill Lumberg, Gary Cole. <laughs> uh, I, again, Gary Cole, uh, truly one of the greats. Yeah. One of the absolute greats. Just a, a remarkable, brilliant uh, actor. Another Chicago guy, another guy who's raised in the Chicago theater. Um, he, uh, Gary Cole was as brilliant and as wonderful as Val was horrible and monstrous and evil. Oh, not a good working uh, with Val, huh? Every, everything you've heard about Val is true. And I mean, every single bad thing you've heard about Val is 100% true. Um, okay. And worse than you think it is. Um, he is the cruelest human being I've ever been around. Um, I've never met someone as, as, as uh, actually purely evil as Al Keller. Oh, wow. Yep. I'm actually writing a book about what Val did on that movie. Um, and it's uh, on day six of that film, Val Kilmer uh, physically assaulted me um, on set. Oh, wow. And we weren't having an argument. We weren't having a problem. He just, uh, he came to set and he was, um, let's say, altered um, that morning. He was four hours late to my set, which was normal on almost any given day on the show. And he um, wanted me to look at his new Crocs. He had gotten a new pair of Crocs. And I was setting up a shot because I was already four hours behind because Val didn't show up. And as I'm setting up the shot, uh, Val thought I should look at his Crocs with my crotch. So he kicked me in the nuts. Oh. Yep. That's day six of that film. Um, no, this is, this is a bad man. It's that simple. And I, I, I have no fear of saying it. Uh, you know, Joel Schumacher has said it before me. Um, and uh, <laughs> a lot of other remarkable directors have said it before me. Um, John Frankenheimer has famously said uh, that Will Rogers never met Val Kilmer. Oh, wow. Um, and also, I think uh, he, he also, John Frankenheimer was quoted by saying uh, that there are two things he won't do in his lifetime. He will never... Uh, uh, climb Mount Kilimanjaro and he will never work with Val Kilmer a second time. Wow. Yeah. And I love Val yeah. Kilmer in uh, Top Secret. <laughs> oh, he's a, he's a fabulous actor. He's yeah. a fantastic technical actor. Um, he's just, uh, sadly, he is, uh, he's a very broken person and he um, wants everybody to be in as much pain as he's in. And that's, that's the shame. That's the shame. He's a wonderful actor. Um, it's just, he's disrespectful. He's disrespectful to his other actors more than anybody else. Yeah. Um, he's, 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 a, he's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. Oh, yep. wow. I'm sorry you went through that. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I look, here's the funny thing. I've had such wonderful, amazing relationships with actors. And again, you know, I, I teach actors every week. I love actors. Um, when I come across a bad one, especially one that, that, that has made a living out of this, this business, um, and I see them mistreat others, especially other actors. Uh, 
I find that unforgivable because when we get a chance to be in this industry, when we get a chance to, to play in, in, in this industry and, and do the things we love to do, um, if you don't have respect for that, uh, I, I have no respect for you. You uh, know what it reminds me of? Gonna... Yeah, please. It reminds me of when Kevin Smith made Cop Out. He was, couldn't wait to work with Bruce Willis because he idolized Bruce Willis until he got him on set. He said it was a nightmare. And the funny thing is, here's the thing. You know, they say never meet your heroes. There's some truth to that, but I have to tell you, um, Gary Cole was one of my heroes. And Gary Cole is now more <laughs> my hero because I worked with him. So for every Val Kilmer, there's five Gary Cole. There's five people you're going to work with in this industry that are brilliant and amazing and lovely and funny and great at their job. Um, but the problem is one Val Kilmer on a movie can sink the entire movie. And for me, conspiracy was a, a script that, uh, that, you know, that was loved that we conspiracy. We finished the first draft on a Tuesday by the following Monday, we had a sale. That's no joke. And I'm saying the very first draft was bought. Yeah. Um, people loved that script and, uh, you know, Sony wanted to make the movie and they got Val attached and um, and we were off to make a movie, and I, I'm telling you, it would have been this remarkable, wonderful experience, except for Val. Wow. And he just made it a misery for everybody. There well, was one day when he wasn't on the schedule. There was just only one day out of the entire shoot that he wasn't on the schedule. It was like a party the whole day. We did the best work of, of the whole shoot the day that Val wasn't there because everybody could enjoy themselves. What was it like for Gary Cole to work with him? A horrible. Oh, um, and and uh, Val would not stay to do Gary's shots. So Gary would be there for Val and do his stuff and, you know, read opposite Val. And then we'd turn the camera around for, for Gary and Val would leave. Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. And Gary Cole, again, one of the one of the best guys and one of the best actors you can ever work with. And that's the way he was treated on my set by by the lead. Um, and again, because Gary is such a gentleman, so wonderful, you know, Gary just rolled with the punches and did what he had to do and gave me a great performance. Loved him in office space. <laughs> uh, he's amazing. Yes. He's amazing. He's everything he does. He is, uh, he is brilliant. Oh, you see him recently in the blockers. <laughs> he's funny in sure, that. Sure. And look, uh, Jennifer Esposito was the female lead of, of conspiracy. Oh um, yes. And again, a, a doll. Easy, just easy, just so fun to work with. And there were several days where Val had her in tears because he was mistreating her so badly. You couldn't fire him? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, he was, the financing was, was on him. Oh. That's how it worked. You, you, we got Val Kilmer in the movie. The movie was financed. Done. That was done. So we got the money because Val was in the movie. And Val was taking a lion's share of the money, um, and he just treated everybody like crap. How, how did he True. treat your wife? Uh, he didn't get to really treat my wife badly because my wife, God bless her, um, there was one particular day when Val uh, was trying. Uh, I had cast one of the women that's one of the leads of Secret Santa, a wonderful actress named Michelle Allaire, who's just beautiful and brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle uh, was in a scene in the beginning of Conspiracy and she's nude in this bed next to Val and she had been waiting six hours because Val was six hours late getting the set oh wow yeah and so she's been sitting there in the bed looking at the script and hanging out Val comes in sees Michelle and is like row row because she's gorgeous he gets in the bed and he starts trying to play grab ass with Michelle and again, Michelle is one of my best friends. We've been, she's been a good friend of mine for 16 years. I'm, I'm, you know, godfather of one of her kids mm -hmm. and, uh, or three of her kids, excuse me. Um, <laughs> her kids are like, uh, seriously, I'm uncle Adam. When I walk in the room, I'm uncle Adam. And, uh, <laughs> and so he starts trying to play grab ass with her and, uh, Deborah rolls up a copy of the script and smacks Val's hand off of Michelle's ass. <laughs> And, and she looks him dead in the face and goes, she's not for you. Wow. Val, Val didn't touch her again. So 
the thing about my wife is that um, she's awesome. She's awesome, and she's scarier than me. <laughs> she's scarier than so, Jason. She's uh, no, I am. I am way more afraid of my wife than I am of Jason Voorhees. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> she's she's way tougher than Jason Voorhees. She don't need no machete, that's for sure. <laughs> but she is uh, no. But I'm telling you, she's uh, again. You know, she's my partner in crime and. Um, it's how I'm able to do what I do is that I've got somebody who's got my back. Oh, wow. Well, it sounds like you've got an amazing wife. You've stayed with her this long. So that's pretty awesome. Congratulations. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. I gotta say, do you got any web pages you want to plug? Um, really, uh, well, secret Santa, the movie.com where Mm -hmm. you can find out everything you want about secret Santa and about where we're going to be and the festivals we're in. Um, and it'll also give news about when the release happens. Uh, also, uh, you know, look us up on Secret Santa uh, on Facebook, just Secret Santa, um, okay. or on Skeleton Crew on, on, on Facebook. Uh, there's also uh, our Instagram handle and our Twitter, Twitter handle, um, it, which is SkeletonCrewPro.com, um, at Skeleton Crew Pro, excuse me, uh, on both of those handles. And you can find me at... Uh, at Adam Marcus 13 um, on Twitter. So that's, that's me, man. That's where I am. And, uh, and just, you know, anybody who sees Secret Santa coming to their town in a, in a local festival, jump in because I'm always there and uh, always happy to talk to the fans and, and get into it. And, uh, and it's just a terrific movie that I'm very excited for everybody to see. Do you ever do the convention circuit? I, you know, I, I, I did way back when Jason Goes to Hell happened. I was at Comic-Con. I was at a few things. Um, I haven't recently, but I, am, I know I'm going to have to start doing it this year. So, uh, so I'm actually kind of excited for it because I love, I love cons. And as a kid, I really loved cons. Yeah. So I am going to start doing Yeah, I, I will be out, uh, especially because this year is the 25th anniversary of Jason Goes to Hell. And we're doing a lot of screenings around the country of the movie of the uncut version. So... You know, it's interesting you mentioned meeting your heroes. I had the pleasure, like, um, I've I've lived uh, for almost 46 years now in uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick. Last November, I was invited by Lisa Langwa, Canadian actress from the movie Class of 1984, a movie I loved growing up. And I've interviewed five of the cast members from it, but Lisa's been on my show a couple times, and she invited me to Horrorama in Toronto and it was the mm-hmm. first time I'd been on a plane. She showed me around Toronto, and she was just a dream to be around. And she's since become a, a really good friend of mine. But uh, she was some one of these people where um, the total opposite of, you know, Kevin Smith's experience with Bruce right. Willis or your experience with Val Kilmer. She was wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And most, and most people are. That's just the truth. Yeah, but uh, but that that was a lot of fun, and I hope to do more convention stuff uh, as well. I know the week that Horrorama went on, um, there was one a horror ham going on in Chicago, and so there's some people from Friday the Thirteenth Part Five, a new beginning. I'd interviewed that that said that they'd love to see me there. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get there, but. Uh, like I've said, I was, I'm, I'm still in touch, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to make the connection. But I don't want to get political, but if the way the political things are going in the States, I don't know if I want to go there. <laughs> I, I totally understand, and I completely agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. It's just a nightmare. <laughs> but you got any charities I'm that you and your wife are involved in? I'm just, I'm just waiting for the midterms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You and your wife involved in any charities? Uh, we are actually. My wife started a non for profit uh, to uh, to get teens to stop uh, to, to actually not ever start smoking, um, and uh, so we've been doing that for a long time. But um, honestly, uh, you know, we 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 do a lot of stuff involved with charities around LA um, because LA is actually a very kind of charitable city. So we do a lot of that, but we don't we don't really do that much with our non for profit anymore, just because I I barely have time to to change my mind um, <laughs> because I am so busy at this point. Well, do, do you want me to share uh, a, a charity that I've shared uh, with, uh, with some of the Friday the Thirteenth actors, and even Nancy McLaughlin took it on? 
Which one? The uh, well, you remember the ice bucket challenge? Sure, sure. I I didn't get nominated for that, but I remember after Robin Williams had passed away, which was a big loss. Yeah, um, sure was. Another charity a challenge came up called the Doubtfire Face Challenge, mm-hmm. and uh, it was for suicide and <laughs> depression. And uh, I, I like this a lot better because you know I I love slapstick humor, and yeah. the whole thing involved uh, uh, taking a pie in the face and you mm-hmm. nominate three people, and uh, that's great. Lisa Langwa did it. And uh, Nancy McLaughlin from Jason Lives did it. In fact, she had some of the props from Jason Lives behind her when she did it. And Scotty McCoy did it. And uh, some independent actors that uh, I threw it out to did it. And I know Deborah Shelton from Body Double is going to do it as well. I love it. Yeah. That sounds great. And I've, I've, some people just haven't had time yet, but I know that uh, Adrienne King, I, I, I think she's going to do it. And I nominated Adrian King, and so did Scotty, so hopefully she comes through. Awesome. I, I think uh, if you nominate my wife and I on, on social media, I think it's definitely something we can do. I think that's cool. Well, if you and your wife do it, will you nominate people from the industry? Absolutely. Because we want to try to get the industry involved. I think it's great. I think it's a great idea. Like, I've never been suicidal, but I'm on an antidepressant, so uh, sure. it kind of just hits you, you know? Sure. A lot of people are, man. And it's and it's something that no one should ever feel any shame for. And it's ridiculous that that there's ever been a culture of shame around it. So I agree with you. Yeah, exactly. But Lisa Langwa did it. Nancy McLaughlin did it. I got those both up on YouTube, too, if you want to check them out. And I um, and I know Nancy nominated a lot of the Jason Lives people, you know. Some people haven't done it yet because I just haven't had time. But I know sure, Adrienne sure, King, sure. I think, is open to it. And uh, she'd be a big one to do it because she was the original yeah. heroine. Absolutely. And, That's a great idea. And Lara Park Lincoln, I think, uh, is open to it. Uh, I think mm-hmm. Scott Scotty threw it out to her. And Jennifer Bonko wants to get both the Tinas to do it. It's a great idea. That yeah. Great. Threw it out to a um, bunch of them. So I thought that I would throw that out there. In fact, Let's <laughs> do it. Lara Park Lincoln said if she, when she does it, she said she's going to nominate Kane Hodder because she said she can get Kane to do anything. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So yeah. Funny. So, yeah, if you and your wife do it, and I'll put it up on YouTube, you know, when, that, when it's – Yeah. Well, that'd be it. perfect, you know. Just film yourself doing it, and if you have an idea who you guys are going to nominate, you can each nominate three people. <laughs> I love it. I think it's a great idea. Okay, well, I'll give you the details about that. I'll throw them to Please you do. on uh, on Facebook, or or you know, or. Please do. I think it sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know what, Adam? You just became my second longest interview as of right now. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yep, you just surpassed Stefan Ardgrim, whose third interview went uh, uh, about an hour and fifty, or no. Uh, uh, 154 minutes, you're up on 156 minutes. The only one ahead of you is Bruce Glover. Love it. <laughs> Speaking Love of it. Friday the 13th, because Crispin was a part of the fourth one. You bet. You bet. Yeah. But yeah, 25 years, Jason goes to hell. Mm-hmm. Where I, I remember when that came out and that was on Vagoria. It's like, where did the time go? Right. Serious. Yeah, you tell me about it. <laughs> wow. What, what, how have you changed as a filmmaker since then? I should ask that. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I'm a better storyteller, that's for sure. I'm a much better screenwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, but where I haven't changed, where I think is the most important thing is I haven't slowed down as far as how much I love this and how much I dream about it. So for me, it's like I'm still like a little kid. I'm still, I still love it so much that nothing makes me happier than, than doing this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm well, a much better storyteller. I'm, you know, I'm a more thoughtful storyteller. And I think as you get older, you should become a more thoughtful storyteller. I think you, you get better and better. The, the trick is to keep that edge, to keep that fire for it. Um, it's how people like Martin Scorsese continue to not just grow and evolve as a filmmaker, but also to become more exciting as a filmmaker. Um, and I think that that's the trick. I think that's why Spielberg is who Spielberg is. 
Who were your inspirations? Go like as a when you were just budding in filmmaker. Who were your inspirations? Well, I, I'm much like many people of my generation, but I was you know I was nine years old when the first Star Wars came out. I was there second day. My father had seen it on opening night and then rushed us to the movie theater for second day. Um, and that movie, you know, really opened my eyes. But I will tell you. Uh, and I remember I said at nine years old, I said, I want to do that for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you, uh, Bob Fosse is my biggest hero. Oh, uh, cabaret. I started in the theater. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I saw uh, Pippin when I was, I think, only five years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, All That Jazz is my favorite film. Ah, uh, yes. So Bob Fosse has always been one of my driving forces. I am a giant Steven Spielberg fan. Like, okay. be a bigger fan of his work. Um, I also adore John Carpenter. Ah, um, uh, yes, I love Halloween. Just truly one of the greatest storytellers of our time. Um, the Thing is, I think, of uh, as near a perfect a movie as you can get. Yes. Um, so yeah, there's you know there's a few of the people, but I love Cronenberg, and I love. Um, you know, I love people as diverse as, uh, you know, Michael Mann is, is a huge inspiration for me. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Alan Parker is one of my favorite filmmakers. So, there, you know, there's, there's so many people out there that I, that I just think are brilliant and that, you know, their movies transport me where I'm not thinking about how to break down the film, but I'm thinking about how much I'm loving the experience of watching it. Well, you mentioned um, Alan Parker and Bob Fosse. Both have done a lot of musical stuff. I was wondering, you did you ever think about doing a, a musical sequence in a movie? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I've got a couple of films where there are musical sequences. Um, oh, perfect. And, yeah, and I will tell you, I mean, look, again, Bernadette Peters, is, you know, is, uh, I grew up watching her as a musical artist mm-hmm. um, in New York. But uh, for me, um, musicals are not dissimilar, let's say, from great comedies or great horror films. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the only genres that you can stop the plot to do a song. Yep. You can stop. You can stop the plot to do a, a scare. You can stop the plot to do a, a piece of comedy. And for me, um, there's greatness in that. There's there's uh, there there is uh, such joy. And again, you know, I grew up in the theater. I directed um, musicals my whole growing up was was in the musical theater. So no, I I, uh, I love musical theater. Love it. Oh wow! Yes, I I love yeah. musicals too. Do you have a favorite musical? Um, all that jazz is that your favorite? Well, all that jazz really isn't a musical. It's 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 a it's a it's a drama with music. Okay. Um, but I you know look I I love things from I like I love Guys and Dolls. Okay. Um, love that show, but I love Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. Um, I think Godspell is one of the great great musicals of all time. Um, I, uh, no, I, 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 it runs the gamut. I, I, I have a lot of musicals that I, <laughs> I just adore. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I congratulate you and your wife for having Thank such you. an enduring marriage. Thank you. Yes. I, I think that's great. You know, you, you don't hear a lot about that and the tabloid. Yeah. I, I try to stay out of the tabloids because I just sure. don't care about sure. the crap they're promoting, but sure, yep. Yeah, but I love hearing stories like this, you know. And uh, thank you. Yeah, so I think it's wonderful that you and your wife not only have been together this long, but you work together. That's yeah. not just a marriage; it's a friendship. Yes, it is, and that's by the way how you end up with a great marriage. Yes, I. Y- yes, absolutely. And yeah, I would love it if you two did, uh, did the Doubtfire Challenge. I'll send you some information on that Please too. Do. Send me the info and we'll do it. I promise you we'll do it. Yes, absolutely. Debbie Sue is another one who said she'd do it as well. So mm-hmm. Scotty threw it out to a whole bunch of Friday people. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Adam, it was just wonderful to have you on the show today, you know, and I hope, I so hope that Secret Santa gets a wide release because I'm Thank definitely you. interested in it. Thank you so much. Yes. And, uh, you know, hopefully maybe maybe they can get you back doing the Friday films. Get that back on that track. Uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yes. Maybe you could send them back to Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Adam, before you go, I was wondering if you'd do a, a plug for my show. Sure, sure. Yeah, j- just just state your name and uh, 
So you're listening to uh, Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada. Oh, goodness. All right. Let me, let me write that all down so I get it exactly right. <laughs> have you ever been out uh, this way before? Uh, I have not. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, not a lot of people know where New Brunswick, Canada is. Uh, I do know where New Brunswick is. Okay. Yes. Uh, hang on a second. Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. What was the rest of it? New Brunswick, Canada, out of New Brunswick, Canada. Out of New Brunswick, Canada. Yeah. Are you familiar with the trailer part, boys? Because they're, they're probably of close. Course. Huh? Of, of course I am. And in fact, my wife did a bit with them on Jimmy Kimmel Live. Oh, wow. I saw that. My wife was in that. Oh, wow. She was, she was the person they, they sold fake tickets to the show to. <laughs> okay. That, <was> <laughs> that is Deborah. Oh, yeah. I love the trailer part, boys. So you want it to be, uh, hi, I'm Adam Marcus, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada? Yeah. Great. Okay. So let me, let me give you that. Okay. Shoot. All right. Got it. Hi, I'm Adam Marcus, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada. Absolutely. He's the director of Jason Goes to Hell and the up. Uh- coming secret santa hopefully it won't be such a secret in cinemas hopefully we'll have that wide release so we can all go check that out so good yes brother absolutely well you have yourself a wonderful wonderful evening and thank you so much for coming on here and uh we'll be in touch i love it please do okay we'll talk soon greg absolutely you take care you too bye-bye now goodbye